OK, now I'd like to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Julie Soar. Dr. Soar is a clinical neuropsychologist and the director of clinical training for the APA accredited OU Clinical Psychology PhD program. Her area of specialty is clinical neuropsychology, which she views as an integration of clinical psychology and neuroscience, or as her students like to put it, keeping the psychology in neuropsychology. Her research reflects this integration and the importance of a good understanding of psychology in order to understand neuroscience. Dr. Soar is a fellow of the Society for Clinical Neuropsychology and the National Academy of Neuropsychology. She is co-editor-in-chief of the Journal of Clinical and Experimental Neuropsychology and the incoming editor for the APA journal Psychological Assessment. She has authored and or co-authored more than 100 peer-reviewed articles in psychological and neuropsychological assessment. And she's the author of a 2017 book on psychological assessment and co-editor of the Cambridge Handbook of Clinical Ass Assessment and Diagnosis, which was released in 2019. All right, and with that, I will turn things over to Dr. Soar. And again, I will monitor the chat. So if you have any questions, feel free to just type those into the chat. Great, I'm glad you all could be here today to talk about the MMPI-3. And uh, I will give you my learning objectives for today. Uh, again, your slides are gonna guide you through the presentation, although I did make some minor changes this morning when I found some typos and things. So uh, that'll keep you on your toes here <laughs> in the next three hours. So my goal for you uh, uh, throughout today is to help you understand the history of the MMPI up to this most recent rendition, the MMPI-3, because I think that context is super important for understanding the test, and particularly for those of you who um, did never, never trans transition to the RF from the two. Um, another learning goal is to recognize the difference between the RF and the two for those who still use the two, but then also between the RF and the three, because there's, there, there are some substantial changes, although much less of a conceptual leap than the, the two to the RF. Uh, also, another learning goal to understand the research basis for the validity of MMPI-3 interpretation. Uh, and then the last two goals are to learn methods for administering and interpreting uh, the MMPI-3 and applying that knowledge to a couple of case presentations. So it's a lofty set of goals for the next three hours, and I will hopefully remember to take breaks or uh, Dr. Austin will tell me it's time for a break. Uh, conflict of interest, um, I'm going to, I don't make any money on any MMPI instruments at all, but just uh, so that you're aware, I'm currently on the advisory board for the University of Minnesota Press Test Division. This is an advisory board based on individuals who've been selected because they're experts in assessment. It's just an advisory role that's mostly uh, helping to inform uh, grant uh, recipients for various projects, um, in uh, specifically for tests that the University of Minnesota Press Test Division publishes, which include the MMPI instruments. Um, I want to start with uh, one of my favorite quotes uh, about the MMPI, um, and to some extent it kind of captures my personal history with MMPI. So when I started graduate school, uh, the original MMPI still was in use, and uh, pretty early in the years of, <laughs> of my graduate school, we switched to the two. So to some extent, I've lived the entire history of the MMPI, which is um, also a little disconcerting to me. But um, but Hathaway, who was a major player in the MMPI, had this quote um, in 1972 when the MMPI already had been in existence for about 30 years. And he said, if another 12 years were to go by without our having gone on to a better instrument or procedure for the practical needs it fulfills, I fear that the MMPI, like some other tests, might have changed from a hopeful innovation to an aged obstacle. And to me, this really captures, again, as I say, my own experience in my personal history with using the MMPI. I was trained by one of the original developers who went to graduate school there and worked there for a while before coming to the University of Iowa. So trained by an MMPI guru. Um, I, I lived, breathed, and ate the MMPI too, um, and, but followed the history of the research as the 2RF was being developed. 
and was teaching the two at that point here at Ohio University and recognized, gosh, there's a lot of really good science coming out about the RF. And so my own clinical attachment to the two um, had to be balanced by the research that was coming out showing the many ways in which the two was flawed. And so we moved to the RF at that point. So to me, my own personal history with the MMPI and its various versions has been a good example of, of a scientist practitioner approach to this test. And the test itself really has tried to constantly look at the science and the research to inform, to inform itself and to become the different instrument that it is today from its original form. So we're going to start with our first learning of goals, which is really looking at the history of it and understanding the development of the MMPI through to three. And uh, still to this day, though, throughout um, pretty much since it first was developed, it has been the most widely used clinical personality test. So not your big five or uh, um, those kinds of personality instruments, but really more of a clinical personality and psychopathology test. Surveys even in the last couple of years have shown this is still one of the uh, tests most often used by psychologists and neuropsychologists to assess personality and psychopathology. But it has a very long history. It was first developed in 1940. And what made it super unique at the time was um, this uh, uh, empirical keying approach. And uh, so for those of you who aren't familiar with the history at all, the goal at that point was not to be theoretical. It was not to take uh, understanding of particular types of psychopathology and look at the construct validity of them or even their content validity and what items should be represented on it. I mean, it certainly wasn't face valid. Instead, they took basically all of the items from all sorts of existing personality psychopathology instruments that were out there, and they did radical empiricism. If an item distinguished a patient that had a particular uh, disorder or diagnosis from uh, somebody who did not have any diagnosis, then that item went on the scale. So it was entirely empirically keyed. If this item could empirically distinguish patients with particular disorders from non-patients, it goes on the scale. Doesn't matter what the content is. And this was extraordinarily novel at the time because most instruments at the time were based on theory or at least on the phenomenology or diagnostic criteria for particular disorders and were entirely content or face valid. Now, what that meant is they, they had content validity, but they were also really e easy to malinger. It would be easy for someone who wanted to present as depressed or anxious or having thought disorder symptoms to know what items they were measuring. And from the very beginning, the MMPI was seeking to distinguish itself in that it was going to be based on empiricism. It was going to find items that did not have that limitation, but that empirically identified diagnostic groups and also the inclusion of validity scales, which also was quite unique at that time for instruments that were used in practice. And it was believed, again, that having those empirically keyed items would lead to maybe very subtle items. In fact, in some cases, very subtle items that makes it a little hard to use the original instruments um, in forensic settings. So I, I know my uh, professor way back in grad school often testified in court and, you know, lawyers would say, what does I like carrots have anything to do with psychopathology as an example for something that has no content validity, but that apparently was an, an empirically supported item. So that original scale had measures, the um, clinical groups they were focused on were sort of the names of the scales It had hypochondriasis, depression, paranoia, psychopathic deviance, hysteria, I'm not doing these in the right order because that's three, um, uh, psychasthenia, schizophrenia, and hypomania. Those were the main scales. Eventually, they also added uh, scale five, for those of you uh, still using the two, the masculinity femininity scale, and also social introversion. So those became the core basic scales. But again, each scale was designed to distinguish people who had, you know, psychasthenia from non-clinical controls. And what that resulted then in was a lot of high intercorrelation between the scales. There was, in fact, a lot of item overlap. Because remember, they did each one in isolation, and yet there are many features that clinical groups might have in common regardless of their specific diagnosis. And so some items did show up in many scales, leading to this high intercorrelation. And so what pretty quickly happened was that 
they switched to instead thinking of empirical correlates of specific scales to patterns of scales that got known as code types. And again, those of you who, who still use two, that's really familiar language to you. And those of you who know the RF don't even know necessarily what I'm talking about. Um, so that was a problem. This high intercorrelation really led to some problems and the code types were an attempt to solve that. Another big problem with that original scale was the norms, and I put norms with a question mark because I'm not sure you can even call them norms unless you lived around the University of Minnesota because they were collected from the population around the University of Minnesota. So it was all individuals from Minnesota, um, which is near where I grew up. So um, it was uh, all individuals who identified as white, rural, working class. The average was eight years of education, so a lot of farmers. Um, there was not a lot of diversity. It certainly wasn't representation, a, a good representation of the US in terms of any sociodemographic characteristics. So that was the original MMPI. And as I just mentioned, with this, this whole issue of empirical keying, not only this potential problem with the high intercorrelations, but this idea of not being face valid quickly became a problem. So even a couple of decades in and before the MMPI 2, um, uh, researchers were introducing content scales. So actually looking back and doing more of a content validity approach to identify, well, what are the items that actually look like the content that would go with specific domains of psychopathology? Um, they were already recognizing a need for that above and beyond this empirically keyed approach. So as the instrument grew up, and again, at the time period that I entered graduate school, the, the MMPI-2 was being developed. So in the whole process of the, through the 80s, the instrument was being re-standardized. And there were many, many goals for it at that point. One big goal was to delete obsolete and objectionable items. Um, this was done by experts in the field, so assessment experts, psychopathology experts, also feedback from clinicians and from individuals who took the test in terms of items that, that might be deemed objectionable. So many of these were items uh, related to religion or were sexist in wording. They removed a lot of bowel and bladder related items. Um, they looked at outdated language and various cultural references. Um, now to maintain consistency, they made the least number of changes to the clinical scales um, because they already now at this point in the 80s had 40 years of empirical correlates to the scales and the code types. And, and the validity scales were also left mostly unchanged in terms of content because they had so much validity data on them. But the rest of the instrument had been changed a little bit more substantially in terms of the item content. Another very big change was a much better normative sample, not just people from Minnesota. And they used the mid-1980s uh, census data to create a, a normative sample that was representative of the socio-demographic uh, distribution in the US at the time based on race, ethnicity, geographic region, um, SES, gender, and age. Um, and this was used to help develop better norms. So the norms were used to calculate standard uniform T-scores across the scales to better facilitate interpretation because the original MMPI, it was really hard to interpret that. So now uh, what most of you are familiar with, the profile sheets had this standard kind of method that created better norms to look for clinical, clinical level elevations across the scales. Um, they also did a lot more validation of the clinical scales um, and interpretation of those scales. So continuing to gather data um, and did some development of some new scales so and, and new validity scales. So um, as I mentioned, the content scales got added in, um, but they also made uh, the Vrin and Trin, which we'll talk about in a second, but that, that was inconsistency in validity scales that before they were only focused on over-reporting and under-reporting. They also added in a, a, a measure called FB for F infrequency back of the test because the clinical scale items were mostly in the front of the test and the content scales were in the back and they wanted a validity item that would go, or validity scale that would go with the back of the test. Many people were using content scales at this point. Um, in effect, the instrument um, at this point had uh, 567 items, which is a lot, even for a true false scale. It was very long. It had 34 different scales. If you counted all the validity scales and clinical scales and content scales and supplementary scales that got developed. There also was a system called the Harris Lingos 
subscales, and this was uh, due to another problem I'll talk about in just a second. They were subscales on the clinical scales to try to find more consistent content within the scales that could be interpretable. Um, they were problematic because they were being so brief. They also had a big standard error of measurement, so they were hard to interpret. In any event, that's a lot of scales, 34 scales, 567 items, and we still had this big problem that there was so much overlap or uh, I, well, there was item overlap which contributed to the high correlations between the scales that they have developed these code code types, mostly two point or three point code types. There were patterns of scales that went together. So you'd have a two four or a four nine or a two seven eight. Um, and that, that then there were empirical correlates of that sort of pattern. But oftentimes people would see code types that didn't fit a two and a three, or there was a two and a three together. So more of like a five point code type. Um, we actually had one in Iowa um, that I had nicknamed at one point the reindeer profile. And we started seeing that a lot, particularly in the neurology clinic, because it was a kind of a combination of everything. Again, those of you who know the two the best, you, you did have a somatic profile. So you got the one three was in there. Um, you also got the Scarlett O'Hara V, so four and six were up with a low five, but then you also had a two, seven, eight because they were depressed, but also reporting unusual neurological and cognitive symptoms that were showing up on scale eight. And so if you think about all those elevations, one and three are up, but so is two, and then four and six are up with a really low five, and then seven and eight are still up, you basically have a reindeer. So it looked like a, a little reindeer profile which again, makes it very hard to interpret this. And, and really, to some extent, interpreting MMPI 2s was a bit of an art, even though there were rules about how much one scale needed to be up from another. Um, it became something that those of us who gave thousands of these were good at doing. And it was one of our favorite things in grad school to have this MMPI guru who would walk into our, our workroom in the clinic and you'd be scoring the profile and drawing it out on the profile sheets and he would glance at it and he would say, blah, 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 and your client is likely this. And, you know, at the time that was really impressive. <laughs> it was like, wow, you've got my client dead on. Well, it's years of empirical correlates that go with those profiles. Um, and he sometimes would do the opposite and draw a profile that would, he felt went with your client and then we'd give them the test and oh, magic. Um, but it was really hard to interpret because of this problem. So, um, uh, consistent with Hathaway's notion that we continue, to, we need to continue to evolve the instrument and develop more, even from the 80s forward, uh, there were continued developments that happened. So in the early 90s, there were new validity scales. Um, the most notable one is FP because that continues forward um, and, and became very important for people working um, with individuals who do have much more severe symptoms of psychopathology. FP was a validity scale for overreporting even relative to individuals who have severe psychopathology. There also was a new underreporting scale called superlative. It didn't live for very long and does not continue forward. Um, in 2003, non-gendered norms were introduced to the MMPI. And the reason for this, uh, the, the, the MMPI 2 had originally created gender specific norms that only showed up on certain scales that you had to have a separate scoring sheet for. And that was because there were raw score differences that had been reliably detected between um, individuals who identify as male and female. But the, even then, the manual commented that it might be OK to use the non-gendered norms if the gendered norms really were yielding the same T-scores. However, um, in 1991, um, use of group-specific norms became illegal, particularly for personnel selection reasons. And so even in the 90s, they were having to create non-gendered norms, and then they just became a standard part of the MMPI in 2000, 2003. Um, and studies showed that for the most part, they were they were fine to use. Um, the Psi 5 scales also were developed through the 90s and into the early 2000s. Um, and the Psi 5 scales were meant to get more at uh, what we might think about today as like the high top movement, if you're familiar with that, or thinking about uh, DSM-5 models for personality disorders. And the goal was to try to develop not scales that indicate current clinical symptoms, but more a temperament oriented perspective. So more about chronic trait light, like behavioral and uh, personality tendencies. Um, and that's continued to evolve over time, but it was using Harkness and McNulty's 1994 model of 
personality psychopathology. So big five versus sci five. And so, and they have uh, traveled forward into the MPI three. So we'll talk about it more in a little bit. Um, and then uh, the RC scales or revised clinical scales began to be developed in the early 2000s. So at this point, there's been 18 years of history on these revised clinical scales that became really the core of the 2RF um, and then really carry forward into the three. And that is the biggest difference between the MMPI-2, for those of you who continue to use that instrument, and then the restructured format or the MMPI-2RF. So why? Why did we have these RC scales? Well, I already gave you some ideas about that, but to kind of cinch that point down, the existing scales on the MMPI-2 were not psychometrically optimal. In fact, they were psychometrically poor um, in a couple of ways. Uh, I mentioned the high intercorrelation, but did you just give you a flavor for why that was such a problem? Um, in clinical samples, multiple clinical samples, the, the average correlation between scale seven, which was called psychasthenia, meant to reflect anxiety, and scale eight, which was schizophrenia, had a 0.9 correlation with each other, 0.9. I mean, that, that doesn't make any sense. If, if those are measures of that, those forms of, or those constructs of psychopathology, it doesn't make any sense. They are not comorbid at that level. What's happening? Why are they so highly correlated? Um, similarly, uh, scale two, which was really kind of reflecting depression, and scale four, which is was called psychopathic deviance, or you know, really reflecting psychopathy, they averaged a correlation of 0.6 in clinical samples, and that didn't make sense either. Those data showed that depression tends to be uncorrelated or maybe very weakly correlated with psychopathy generally. And the reason for that was this massive item overlap. Um, so this empirical keying, which was meant to be a novel, new, fabulous uh, procedure, was actually a downfall in that it, it makes sense that the same items that would distinguish anxious people from non-anxious people might be the same kind of items that would distinguish depressed individuals from non-depressed individuals. And again, we'll return to that in a minute. Um, Another problem is radical empiricism jeopardized the actual construct validity. Remember, these scale, any item that distinguished these groups went on the scale, which meant that the content within any given scale wouldn't necessarily be consistent. <laughs> um, there was a lot of heterogeneous content going on in there, which meant that, okay, well, the scale could be elevated maybe because of this set of items or this set of items. Again, that might have been what led to um, code types in addition to the item overlap. So um, in the original um, uh, MMPI-2, if you just looked at the what were called the empirical correlates of scale four, which was psychopathic deviance, again, so psychopathy kinds of things, you'd see things you would expect. High scores on scale four would indicate a history of risk-taking behavior, or a history of troubles with authority, those types of things that you would expect but also had um, empirical correlates that included likely has depression, likely has anxiety, likely is pessimistic, likely has insecurity. That doesn't make sense when it was scale four. But again, this was the item overlap issue and why we had to do code types. So instead you would say, oh, somebody with a 4-2 profile, here's their empirical correlates versus somebody with a 4-9 profile, here's their empirical correlates and they looked very different. But that complicated interpretation, it just made it that much more difficult. And of course, it, the other part of this construct validity goes back to the issue with what the so-called subtle items, the items that weren't matched in content validity to the construct they were measuring. And they just didn't work empirically. Those subtle items, as much as those of us who used the MMPI and really believed in radical empiricism thought they would work, Empirically, they just didn't work. The scales were more valid without them in some preliminary analyses that they did. Um, and so coming back to the issue of, well, what's causing some of these problems? Um, Telegan had introduced an idea out of the psychotherapy literature called demoralization. And he described this specifically as a kind of the nonspecific transdiagnostic consequence of any form of psychopathology that just leads to distress. 
an individual with psychological distress is going to have this sort of non-specific affect experience. And that's going to be true. That's what motivates people to seek treatment. That's a, a big component of what might be responsive to treatment as opposed to specific symptoms. And Telegan conceptualized that specifically as having high amounts of negative affect, negative symptoms like depression or uh, anxiety and agitation and anger kinds of components, but also low positive affect, that you're not experiencing positive affect. And so that was a combination of those things would be called demoralization. And, um, and it was part of the psychopathology or psychotherapy research. And so this theoretical construct might explain this overlap that was occurring um, using an empirically key method. So their goal was maybe what we need to do is try to identify what is demoralization and try to separate that out from all of the scales. And that's literally what they did. So in the 2RF, the goal was we know our clinical scales already have a lot of empirical correlates, have diagnostic correlates, but, but they're ugly psychometrically in terms of being all a lot of overlap. It's hard to interpret. Can we make them cleaner? Can we pull out and create revised scales that reflect the core of, of the, of the con constructs they were hoping to develop? So the first thing was, let's find demoralization in MMPI and a series of factor analytic studies, mostly focus on clinical scales two and seven, because two was the depression scale, seven psychasthenia was the anxiety scale, tended to be where that low positive affect, high negative affect kinds of symptoms would live. They identified 23 items that reflected this construct. Um, again, they were calling it patienthood at first and then demoralization really was what captured it. So just general overall psychological distress that's both negative in nature, but also not having positive um, psychological experiences. And that using that scale, then once they identified those items and made a scale out of it, they then looked at all of the clinical scales, doing principal components analysis for the most part. There, there's a lot of different complicated statistical models here that are beyond our purpose today. But the idea was, can we take them, can we do factor analyses to extract factors, one of which is probably the shared variance with demoralization, and what is unique? What are the items that aren't loaded with demoralization that could be the core component of each scale? And then they took those new clinical, cleaner clinical scales and looked to make sure they were internally consistent within themselves and didn't overlap too much with each other and still remained relatively unique from demoralization. And they called those seed scales. So they had these much smaller clinical scales that were called seed scales. Remember, a lot of the MMPI was not on these clinical scales. A lot of the items, 567 items, most of them were not in the clinical scales. They took all the rest of the items then and correlated them with the seed scales, looking to make sure that they were loading into the seed scale and did not also load with demoralization so that they could reload back up these revised clinical scales. And so that's what they did to create what got known as the RC scales. Again, this was over a period of time and there were several papers that were coming out. Um, as I was teaching the MMPI-2 at that point, but reading the literature, I was seeing all these new studies about these new RC scales. And they did about five years of study. They published papers on them. They looked at empirical correlates of them. They looked at psychometric properties of them compared to the old scales. And they did all that before they introduced it as an entirely new instrument. Um, and it was at that time I became compelled and I started to have my students read those stories, those articles like, okay, this, this instrument's going to change. It's going to change pretty dramatically. Um, so we should be paying attention to this. And when they put out some sample uh, ways to score the RC scales, so you could look at it in your own data, score both the traditional and the RC to see what's happening. Uh, we did that in our clinic because we wanted to see how is this going to behave differently? Does this make sense? Um, and so what they did find in fact, is those RC scales had way better internal consistency, way better test retest reliability than the original scales. So they were sounder from a reliability perspective. They still found consistent with the old one that some of the validity scales had lower reliability. 
And as many of you know, when you look at profile sheets, it just means you have to have a um, higher T-score before you can interpret it clinically because they have a larger standard error of measurement. And during this time, again, they were uh, gathering empirical um, correlates of the scales, and then the new um, version came out in 2003. Or, I'm sorry, to the um, around 2003, they were doing those studies. But 2008 is when they actually published it as a scale, so five years later. Um, so the new, it's not new anymore, my goodness, it's, it's already quite old, but when this came out, it was very new and very different. Um, and they used these RC scales as the basis of what was called the MMPI-2 restructured format. Um, but it differed in other ways as well. So it had the nine validity scales, it had the nine revised clinical scales, it had what were known as 28 substantive scales. Um, there were three higher order scales, so that was very new and very different, and it was based on uh, hierarchical models of psychopathology, which I'll talk about again a little bit later because that remains true in the three. They had 23 specific problem scales and two interest scales, but all of this is in the context, and they it did include the cipher. Five scales, they revised them and included those, but in the context of a much reduced number of items. So from 560 some items, it went to 338 items. It became a much shorter instrument, um, which made it much more user friendly. So it was a very new, these clinical scales, as I said, were restructured. And what happened with all that new empirical reevaluation that I was just talking about meant that there aren't subtle items anymore. They didn't work empirically. So now it is really more content valid although that was based on empiricism. They removed the overlap in the, in the items on the different scales, which minimized multiple scale elevations due to that item overlap. And they have a new clinical scale, demoralization, that was a confounding factor on the old clinical scales, but now scans, stands as a scale of its own. They added in more validity scales, which again we'll come to because, because they've stayed on the three. They had more clear, content scales or specific problem scales. And the sci-fi, while it had been introduced, it wasn't part of the original two. Um, and so it was being included. The other thing that was very different, and again, for those of you who are, are users of two, is that on the two RF, some scales were able to be interpreted when they were low, and that was novel and new. But in many ways, the RF was still old. It was the MMPI-2 restructured format. So they're just restructuring the old instrument. There was an advantage to that and also a disadvantage. So the items could not change. Um, while that was an advantage to some degree because it meant people could take their old MMPI-2 protocols and recode them to the RF. The same items had been given, not in the same order and in the midst of about 200 extra items, but the items did exist. You could recode them into the RF protocols um, this also meant, though, that you couldn't introduce new items, you couldn't reword items, you couldn't introduce new constructs that could be assessed with new item content. And that is potentially problematic, of course, because research on psychopathology had evolved since the instrument was developed and there were other constructs that people would have liked to have had scales on and that you can't do if you don't have some new item content. So that's it's old in that sense. And of course, the norms didn't change. So while the norms were great for uh, the 1980s, just when the census data was used to develop the norms, they are essentially the same with, except the elimination of the gender specific norms. So, um, and here we are in 2020. So those norms are very outdated. So what did they do to validate the restructured format? Well, I just mentioned one of the advantages was we could recode old MMPI-2 data under the restructured format. And so they had many, many archival data sets. There were a lot of publications that came out where they recoded it. Again, this is not completely ideal because you're not taking the instrument exactly as standardized. You're filling out 567 items, not the 338 items. But it meant that they had a lot of samples from different settings that are very typically used um, or that very typically involve administration of MMPI. And then of course, there were a lot of new studies that came out specifically on the RF version 
that they put into the manual and that have been published since that time, looking at all sorts of different kinds of presentations. Um, uh, and these are just a small sampling of what was available. But in the manual, they were able, they were able to take 70,000 different protocols that were rescored to the RF to help establish the empirical correlates, and then several new studies on the RF specifically to further develop the empirical correlates of the test scores, which have always been the basis of MMPI interpretation. Not theory, but empirical correlates of the scores. Another thing that, that happened with the CHU as well as the RF, not to the degree that it should, but that there have been several studies looking at, are can we use this in diverse groups? So again, the MMPI-2 included diverse groups in their normative group based on a now very dated census, um, and the RF used that uh, normative data. But there have been studies, particularly using US samples, mostly focused on individuals um, who identify as Black or African American or Hispanic Latinx. Uh, relative to uh, uh, white population norms and meta-analyses of those kinds of studies show there have not been um, big differences either in mean scores or what's really more important, the correlates. So do these empirical correlates differ by race or ethnicity? No, it, it does not appear that there's any um, major intercept bias or predictive bias in the instrument. Although again, there should have been a lot more studies done that, than there were but there, there were several. Um, one thing that was apparent in a couple of studies is that specifically for Asian Americans um, who immigrated here, level of acculturation was relevant, um, often as assessed by years of living in the US, sometimes by actual acculturation measures, that some of the empirical correlates did differ for that group. And there weren't a lot of studies in the LGBTQ plus community, there, there just was not a lot of peer reviewed data on the two and then and then the RF, there were a couple of papers. Um, that is something that the three has as a focus is, you know, uh, uh, looking at diversity right up front and in, in various diverse groups. So one thing I will remind you of is that you should never rely on just a manual for any test for purposes of really looking at the uh, construct validity, predictive validity, appropriate clinical use of an instrument, you've got to go digging in the research literature beyond when a manual is published to look and see, are there data specifically on a population that's relevant to your practice or, or that's relevant to your practice setting? Because um, you will always find more data than it's available in, in a manual. Right now though on the three, you're pretty much going to find it in the manual because that just came out in December. So pros and Cons to the RF, obviously the fact that it's shorter, went from 567 to 338, that means it's much more user friendly. Um, people can get it, get it taken a lot faster. Um, it's more face valid, that also makes it more user friendly. There were always issues with people not understanding why they were being asked questions that were quote unquote subtle, but also had no content validity. Um, it also was shown to have um, a sixth grade reading level as appropriate, and some studies even suggested 4.5 to a fifth grade reading level was appropriate because the items are true false. And so if you think about scales that do sort of a never, always, sometimes, but then they're also coded negatively, that, that reading comprehension level is a bit higher, whereas if it's just a simple true false statement, the reading comprehension can be a little bit lower and, and people are still comprehending it well. Again, so overall increased user friendliness of the instrument. And of course, <laughs> much easier to interpret. Um, we don't have all of these codes and code types and having to code for the code types. It was a much easier instrument I found as a clinician and as someone instructing students for the first time and using it much easier to teach than the two and three point code nightmares and code books on trying to, to, to help students learn it. But it was not renormed. It is now in the MMPI-3. Um, and interestingly, there were a lot of folks that still didn't accept it. They were very devoted to the old method. Um, I, I was for a while, but convinced then by the, by the data itself that this was a better instrument. But people viewed the loss of like a one free uh, profile to be very difficult. So those who were in the medical setting really missed that profile because scale three became uh, something different and now in the three is completely different. 
Um, but I think what's important is that, that now that three has come out, two is not going to be available much longer because it is in fact considered an obsolete instrument. The, the norms are so old. So it is, it's going to be something that disappears. And so that choice won't be there if you're going to use an MMPI, you'll have to move on. And again, no chance in, in the RF to address any outdated or potentially inappropriate items because they kept the same items. It was just a restructured format. And as I already mentioned, you couldn't add in new items either. So there were constructs that clinicians found important and would like to have measured and that research suggests are important that they couldn't introduce because it was the same items. So that brings us up to the three, which just came out here in December. And it is, in a sense, both old and new, but the three, some of its changes mean you can't, there's no longer the advantage that the RF had that you could take a two and still calculate an RF profile. You cannot do that anymore. And the biggest reason is it still has similar number of items, but only 263 of the 335 are from the two RF. It is in fact, a mixture of old and new items, the old items that have held the test of time and continue to be supported empirically, and then new items. There are also new scales and others that have been very substantially revised given item changes. So even the scales are not necessarily exactly the same, although many of you will recognize uh, some of the basic ones. Um, also, although there are still the, the traditional standard score interpretation, the traditional profile sheets, although you will see from my handout, I don't like the profiles um, because I think that impedes interpretation. Um, but they also allow data in the technical manual where you can compare two individuals in similar clinical settings. So you will have tables in the technical manual where you could say, oh, well, if I am in an inpatient psychiatric setting. What is actually the normal or the average score and the standard deviation for individuals in that setting versus in the normative uh, sample. So that I think will help facilitate interpretation. We haven't had an opportunity personally to use that yet. Julie, I'm going to jump in Julie, there. Julie, I'm going to jump mind. in there. Don't sure. mind. I think maybe that's a great place maybe to take that's a great five place. to ten minute break if people can come back at just before one o'clock. Before one o'clock. We'll get started back up. We'll get started back up. Cool. Thanks. Thanks, Megan. Thanks. 
OK, hopefully most everyone has had a chance to wander back at this point. So Julie, if you want to pick back up where you left off, we can get started again. That means I have to come back. <laughs> <laughs> OK, uh, we were talking about the MMPI 3, I think. Yes, the new, yes, the new MMPI. Uh, so what were their goals? Um, well, a big one was getting these new items. Uh, they introduced somewhere around 130 items, uh, either by existing items that were completely rewritten or by introducing about 95 new trial items uh, that were candidates for inclusion and to uh, uh, focus on new constructs as well, which we'll see when we look at it. And then, of course, to update the norms, which were in bad in need of being updated. So in order to do this, they did a lot of field data testing um, and they used real clinical settings to get this data, um, generating over 14,000 individual protocols from various real clinical settings to help develop those scales, but also validate the scaled scores, um, looking for empirical correlates of the new scores and assembling various comparison groups. To generate these various empirical scores, they used clinician ratings, they used reviews of records, they looked at um, therapy outcome data, they looked at other test scores if those were available from other psychological tests or cognitive tests. Um, they looked at forensic outcome data, so tracking people over time, looking at arrest records, etc. Um, in, the, in the job um, arena, they looked at job performance ratings, uh, they looked at psychosocial history, basically to identify empirical correlates, which has always been true of, of the MMPI and its approach, is look for the empirical correlates in as large of samples as you can get. They also, th though, did some research data collection at colleges and universities, again, another 8,000 or so protocols predominantly then with undergraduates, but looking across many, many different collateral measures, um, both self-report and collateral report collateral measures to get at empirical correlates. And they developed normative data. So over 3,000 people were sampled, including a separate US Spanish language normative sample. They used the 2020 projection um, census data from the Census Bureau to match the, the final sample on several demographic characteristics for the US. So the final state of the norms themselves, again, collected across the US. Uh, keep in mind, most of them were collected in an electronic administration, although they did offer paper and pencil to some of them. Um, they ended up with about 2,000 people who provided va valid protocols based on the validity scales that could be used. Um, and they selected 1,620 of them to approximate the census data again, using those 2017 projections for 2020, um, race, ethnicity, education, and age. And uh, the rest of this slide is focused kind of on, well, how did they do? They did generally well uh, matching on race, ethnicity with regard to the census data, although there was a slight underestimation uh, of Hispanic Latinx individuals because of issues related to being bilingual. Um, they also have a slight underrepresentation in the older age group and then also of individuals with less than high school education. And that was predominantly because um, there were a higher number of invalid protocols that were generated in the lower education group. So even though we had, they had collected a lot of data, they, as, as you can see higher up, they lost about 300 or so profiles based on um, invalid protocols. And that was in, in those who were um, under, under high school education. The intended use of the scale is to be just a broadband assessment of self-reported personality and psychological functioning, and it can be used in a wide range of psychological and psychomedical um, assessments, according to the manual. So it is meant to measure, again, personality traits, but also psychopathology symptoms, behavioral tendencies. It is uh, useful in assessment, but also could inform treatment planning and has been used not just in standard clinical settings, but also in ones that are more uh, potential forensic legal settings, so in forensic settings, um, and also in public safety evaluations. Um, the instrument is true to its original 1940 purpose and that it isn't really tied theoretically to any specific uh, 
model psychopathology or phenomenologically to any particular diagnostic system. Although some of the empirical correlates do include DSM-5 diagnoses because that's data that they collected as part of the, of the development of the test in terms of empirical correlates. So giving the instrument, um, user qualifications really haven't changed from all the prior versions of the MMPI. It's expected that the users will have graduate level training and psychological testing and assessment, graduate level training in psychopathology and personality, and also training and supervised experience in administering scoring and interpreting the new instrument. You're on your way to that now with this workshop, getting some training, training in the new instrument. Um, if the instrument's being used by a technician or a student, it's assumed that will be under the supervision of a qualified user. In terms of actual administration, um, as again has always been true uh, for the MMPI and is certainly consistent with our um, ethics code um, in the fact that we are obliged to protect the security of our test materials, and that includes the booklets and any auditory recordings and manuals and scoring templates and profiles, et cetera, that individuals should be supervised. They should be able to fill out if it's in person in the privacy of the in a private clinic room, but in the clinic, you should never send really any psychological test home to be filled out with any individual because it violates test security. Um, but um, in the clinic, they should be able to be in a private setting, and it, but it's still desirable to be in their line of sight or to check on them because you want to be ensured they complete it alone, that they're not getting help on their phone or a computer. Under telehealth, we know, of course, that has been more complicated. The MMPI was one of the tests that did allow you to uh, administer it remotely, but that you should still provide some remote supervision. So keeping the camera on while they're still filling it out, being aware of what they're doing, having them sign that they are um, not going to be uh, taking camera shots or videotaping or, or any of those sorts of things to maintain test security. It's always important to check for limitations to testability with regard to the person's ability to see the test, to read it and have a, a appropriate reading comprehension. So the manual encourages you to check for visual impairment. There is an auditory administration, an audio administration alternative. Um, it's important to note that the, the manual makes it clear that you do want people to have privacy when they're taking it, however. So you shouldn't, if somebody is visually impaired or has uh, reading comprehension difficulties, you shouldn't read the items and then ask them to give you the responses. You still need to have a way that they can privately record their true false responses and you could later transcribe it um, to protect their, their privacy and make sure that they're not, uh, that they're able to provide the true false responses just as someone else would and not potentially be drawn to socially desirable responses because they're giving their answers directly to you. Um, with regard to English language fluency or reading comprehension, again, at 4.5 grade reading level might be okay. Sixth grade, you're definitely safe. Appendix D of the technical manual um, gives you a little bit more information about reading comprehension. Um, uh, and you can certainly give a reading ability test to determine if there are limitations um, to help you make that judgment. And um, in terms of actually then administering it, whether or not you're administering it by computer or doing the standard uh, paper and pencil version, you are uh, you should read the directions verbatim to them and you should not augment or alter them. And you don't want to provide clarification or interpretation of items. They need to interpret the items themselves. Um, you can certainly read the items item to them, but you don't want to interpret it or clarify what it might mean. It's what they think it means. And just restating the standard directions is what's strongly recommended. Um, the, because there are only 334 items, the test is shorter. It takes about 25 to 35 minutes um, on the computer if they're doing computer administration. Um, the estimates in the development of the test for the using the booklet and filling in the dots is 35 to 50 minutes. But keep in mind that, that they asked people in the standardization and the normative sample to choose whether they wanted the computer and the paper or pencil. And a higher proportion of the older adults wanted the paper and pencil. So that longer estimate of taking close to an hour is potentially confounded by the fact that it was the older adult population predominantly who took the paper and pencil version where they also tend to 
uh, go more slowly on cognitive um, items anyway. So, um, so that may be kind of a slight overestimate. And if you are giving the paper and pencil version, it's so important for you to check right away before you stop, giving them a chance to fix any items that they might have missed where they didn't provide a response or if they did a double response. So if they filled in the dot and it's both true and false, this will help you so much. It's not an issue if it's computer administered, but if you check that over very quickly so you have a chance to ask them to fix it before you try to score it, you will save yourself a lot of heartache. There are lots of different ways you can score it. Um, certainly, we still you can buy the uh, materials to do it by hand. Um, that is fine. It's your cheapest option. It is going to take you time to do that and put all those wonderful bubble sheets down. Um, you should double and triple check your scoring um, uh, if you do it that way. But there's nothing magical about the computerized version versus the hand scoring version in terms of interpretive ability because everything that is that comes out of a computerized administration in terms of its interpretability is lifted directly from the manual. It is not already integrated and interpreted in a way that you can use that. You certainly, as would be consistent with our ethics code, you certainly should not just lift what's on the computer for its interpretation and throw it into your report. You're still going to need to do a lot of work to interpret it. It's just a narrative. So, it is much easier, the easiest way is administering it by the computer. You're gonna have the least amount of human error because it will, they're taking it and it will automatically provide you the raw and the T-scores for all the scales. It'll give you the percentage of items answered on each scale so that you can see about the cannot say items. It'll give you a list of unscorable items. It gives you the scales they fell on. It gives you the list of items on the critical scales. It can automatically do this plot with the comparison groups, the new clinical comparison groups. So that's a bonus. And it just saves you that human error of um, a hand scoring or if you're going to enter their answers into a keyboard and doing it that way. You can also scan and mail in for computerized scoring. Um, all those just reduce human error. So you're getting more reliable scores. But in terms of interpretation, there's no benefit whatsoever to the computerized version. And that's our hope kind of for the rest of, of the session today is to look at, okay, how do you interpret this instrument? It's, for those of you who are familiar with the RF, some of this is gonna look really familiar, but it's gonna be, hopefully, the method that I introduced to you might help if you always kind of struggle with putting it all together. Um, for those of you who still use the two, this is all gonna be really new. Um, so, um, so hopefully the, the slides that come, we're going to kind of go scale by scale and domain by domain, and then we're going to integrate them together and do a couple of cases in the rest of our time together. So MMPI-3 has 53 total scales on it. There's three higher order scales. There's actually nine clinical scales if you count demoralization, or is it eight? In any event, it's eight or nine. You'd think I would know that, but we'll see in just a second. Um, two of them have what is known as critical item content. And those are scales where uh, if there's a scale elevation, you want to go back and look at what items are, are endorsed on that. Um, 26 specific problem scales, five of them have critical item content, the five sci five scales, and then also 11 different validity scales. Quick note about the cutoffs though. So the manual makes this clear in a couple places. I'll probably emphasize it a little bit later. Um, although there are cutoffs that are recommended and you're going to see in the slides that I've presented and the handouts that you have that what I've kind of done is do a cliff notes of what the manual says in terms of what are the cutoffs that for high or low scores. Um, so when you look at that, that is the cutoff that's in the manual. But the manual points out these are not rigid. They are not completely defined, they're heuristic guidelines. So they should apply broadly across many clinical sections or settings, like score of less than 39 is low across a variety of clinical settings. A score of 65 or above is high for most of the scales in across many clinical settings. But there may be setting specific considerations you wanna make. So uh, for example, there is some research that uh, you might have to have different cutoffs on validity scales if you are working in a forensic setting because the base rate of malingering is so much higher in that setting, you may actually be able to use a lower cutoff, for example. 
again, this speaks to wanting to go and look at setting specific research data. And the new technical manual has a whole bunch of that. They have um, the technical manual is sitting right next to me and the book is very thick and has a whole bunch of data on some of the most common clinical settings that the MMPI is used in so that you can look up, the, look up those different data. Um, in my interpretation guidelines much later, we're going to talk about the issue related to considering all the scores, considering the fact that something that's T equals 64, okay, well, that's very near the cutoff of 65. Heuristic guidelines, maybe that's worthy of consideration, for example. But we also have to consider another issue when we think about these cutoffs, and that is base rates. We have to think about base rates. This is literature, the study I'm gonna cite is one of many studies, but it's the MMPI-2. And the issue here is when we think about standardized scores, percentiles, et cetera, the data that we get in the vast majority of tests out there is considering each score in isolation. So on this one subscale score, a T-score of 65 or greater is only 8% of the normative population. So that seems unusual. Hmm. Only 8% of the normative population had this. That's an unusual score. But the problem is we don't look at these test scores in isolation. We look at them across all the scores. And there's a lot of scores on an MMPI, just like there's lots of scores on a WACE, for example, or on any broad-based psychological instrument. We need to consider those probabilities. And Odland, in 2011, published a paper that was based on the MMPI-2 and they showed that 36% of the normative population scored at least at T of 65 or greater on at least one out of the 10 clinical scales. Again, keep in mind that the clinical scales were the basis of the MMPI-2 interpretation. If you only had those 10 scores, a third of the normative sample scored at 65 or above on at least one of them. So what does that mean? A third of the normative, that means it's not that unusual for someone to score high on at least one of the 10 clinical scales when you consider all of them together. And it's not that rare of an occurrence then. 8% when it's in isolation, 30%, 6% when you think of the 10 scales. Now, if you use all of the clinical and supplemental scales, which of course there were a lot of on the MMPI-2, 67% of the normative population scored that high on at least one of the scales. 39% on at least two, and 33% on five or more if you looked at all the MMPI-2 scales together. Now, um, this was MMPI-2 data, and remember those scores correlated, the, the subscale scores correlated really highly with each other. So if you think about the RF, it likely changes the base rates of having two or more or three or more because the scales didn't correlate as strongly with each other. But the issue with regard to one high isolated score remains. 36% of the po normative population that was the MMPI-2 and the RF norms scored at least 65 or above on at least one scale out of the 10 clinical ones. And again, 67%, more than two thirds, at least that high on at least one when you considered the whole group of scales that was on the MMPI-2. So the issue becomes this, you know, these heuristics, we have to think bigger than the test data and think about assessment. I know that 65 to some extent is arbitrary. It's representing 8% of the normative population in this isolated scale. So what's 64? Not that different. However, I also know if there's one out of all of these scales that's elevated, that's not that unusual. And I need to be considering this in the context of extra test data before I interpret it. So you gotta be smarter than your test. All right, the MMPI manual recommends that the first place you're really gonna look at is protocol validity. And that's one of the beauties of the MMPI and certainly it's a shared feature of the PAI and the MCMI that there are some validity scales, but the MMPI is the most comprehensive when it comes to validity scales. And given the research data out there on the base rates of non-credible responding, usually over-reporting in the settings that we work in, but certainly in the personnel kind of environment or public safety environment, under-reporting is a very big issue as well, very high base rate. We need these validity scales to do our job well. It's important for us to know that our data is accurate. And the protocol validity measures in the MMPI cover several domains. One is 
what we would call non-responsive. It's the cannot say, cannot say scale that are un unscorable, basically. And it's non-responsive because they either didn't give a response so we don't know if it's true or false. Or again, in the hand uh, administration method, they bar marked both true and false, which makes it very difficult to know what their response should have been. But protocol validity in the MMPI also includes inconsistent responding. And we're gonna see that there's actually on the MMPI three, there's three different scales for inconsistent responding. There's also over-reporting scales. So over-reporting of symptoms, and the MMPI includes under-reporting scales, the two classics that most of you are familiar with if you have any history with the MMPI. So as I said, the first one is that cannot say scale, which is content non-responsiveness. Um, the tricky part when you're scoring by hand, this is, they can be hard to catch if someone did both true and false, because if you, those of you who did the bubble sheets recall, you're putting it down and you're just checking to see if the bubbles filled in, and you might not notice that behind the transparent, kind of semi-transparent um, template, the other spot was also filled in. So you're missing the fact that they are not scorable items potentially. Uh, but nevertheless, the, the issue here really becomes um, how many there are. It's reported just as a raw score um, on the instrument and as the proportion of content non-responsive unscorable items on any given subscale are un unscorable, then it's increasingly uninterpretable. Um, if there are 15 or greater overall in the test, you're definitely going to have concerns, although it may be, you know, specific to specific subscales. And, and that is the beauty of the computerized administration, because you actually can see uh, which scales really easily where they fell on, whereas in the hand scoring, you have to kind of go back and do it by hand. But you can look and see, okay, well, if there's uh, less than 90% scorable items on the scale, I, I don't, I can't interpret the absence of an elevation, because for the most part, this reflects not reporting uh, psychopathology that that you probably should or you might have because you don't know that was it was not scorable for the most part. Um, and you can certainly look at well, what scales did it fall on? You may find themes. You might find domains that they weren't willing to report on, for example. So scoring high on this might reflect a lack of cooperation. It might reflect problems with reading comprehension. It might reflect a lack of insight or self awareness. It could be that they're very obsessive up and, and very content driven by the meaning of the item and they don't like true or false absolutes and so they just leave it blank. There's there's lots of potential speculation here, but the main issue is if there's too many, it's gonna be hard to interpret and usually in the direction that a non-elevation is not gonna be interpreted because you don't know that that was a lack of a scale. And even if something is clinically high, it could be an underestimate of the severity of the problem. And that's of course if it's a if it's left blank. When both true and false are answered, you might still be scoring it. So and I just said that. All right. So um, the whole next set of validity scales are are the inconsistency ones. The new uh, uh, um, inconsistency validity scale is the CRIN or combined response inconsistency. Um, which is kind of a combo of the VRIN and the TRIN. So it's kind of any inconsistency. Just like in the old um, uh, uh, version of VRIN and TRIN, the issue is there's pairs of items that are somewhat similar in content, and, and that's what CRIN is capturing. So you're answering items similar in content in opposite directions. Um, it's considered invalid, it, or the profile would be considered invalid if it reaches a T-score of 80 or more but scores between 70 and 79 should be interpreted with some caution. And as the manual points out again, what you're gonna see from this point on are sort of cliff notes of what the manual says. So you can always refer to these slides if you don't have your manual in front of you. Um, is this could be reading or language limitations, cognitive impairment, an error when somebody hand administered, like if you get off an item, it might look inconsistent, intentional random responding, carelessness or lack of cooperation. So CRIN is a combined response inconsistency. VRIN and TRIN kind of separate out uh, somewhat reasons for them. So TRIN I'm gonna talk about first because that's, it's called true response inconsistency, but it's actually either true or false. So it's when inconsistency results, these were item pairs that are quasi reversals. So that if you're getting an inconsistencies because you had a tendency to say true all the time or a tendency to say false all the time. 
And so the way that the MMPI 2RF and the 3 scored that was um, the raw scores are higher when it's in a fixed true direction and really low when it's fixed false. But the way they put it on the profile sheet lined it up so the T scores that were high were either T or F and you have to mark down that it was high because of T or high because of F. And again, invalid profile if the score is 80 or more, but scores between 70 and 79 should be interpreted with some caution. And then RIN was just variable response inconsistency. So out of the inconsistent pairs, these weren't ones where it could be due to this tendency to always say true or always say false. So when CRIN, RIN, or TRIN are um, potentially invalid, it is important for you to consider explanations. And that's, you know, again, based on potentially your extra test data. Was it somebody for whom you thought the reading difficulty could be there, um, that maybe we're pushing the limits there? Is it somebody who's being uncooperative? Again, is it someone who lost their place on the answer sheet, which if you have it in front of you, you could see that they, oh, they skipped an item and now every item after that was probably the wrong item. Um, and again, do they have a tendency to say true and false to something? So you can uh, use your extra test um, clinical skills to kind of consider that. But if it's too high, the profile is invalid and you're done. They're not going to be able to interpret it. And then um, there are overreporting scales. So some of these are going to look familiar to you. Again, overreporting overall in the MMPI is items that are being endorsed that are infrequently endorsed by other individuals um, and other individuals in specific groups, as we'll talk about in just a second. So if you score high on any of these overreporting scales, you are endorsing a lot of items that are not typically endorsed by whatever the comparison group is. This is considered then inaccurate reporting of dysfunction. It doesn't imply intentionality. It doesn't imply motivation for it. You know, one potential reason for overreporting could be inconsistency, but we just maybe ruled that out. So if there's no evidence of inconsistency, you've already ruled out that explanation, and you're going to be focused on here's some overreporting scales. So F is the classic overreporting scale, and these are items, again, rarely answered in the key direction by the normative sample. Um, again, possible overreporting scores from 75, T scores of 75 to 89, maybe overreporting 90 to 90 time, and definitely invalid at 100. Now, you know, there are folks, and sometimes in research, they'll say, oh, we got rid of all protocols over 100 because that's where the manual says invalid. But what they're missing is the fact that it could be overreporting at these other levels. Um, it, it, you want to consider other extra test data there, and you want to consider the, the other validity scales. So again, we don't want to think about these each in isolation. Um, it also can help to look at it. So like if F is high and you wonder, hmm, well, is this reflecting significant psychological difficulties? Then you can look at other scores. For example, FP. So FP is infrequency psychopathology. These are items that are rarely endorsed in the key direction, even by individuals with genuine severe psychopathology. T equals 70 to 79 as possible over reporting and 100 is considered invalid. So you might be able to look at combinations of these. Okay, F was high and FP is not high. Um, uh, you might still see F is high and then also some of the later ind indicators are not high or high because sometimes the combination of non-credible somatic or cognitive symptoms will lead to an overall F elevation too, as well as some others. But this can help distinguish genuine psychopathology if you look at the combo of F and FP. FS um, is in, called infrequent somatic responses. So these are items that are rarely endorsed by um, in the key direction by medical patients who are receiving treatment for various um, somatic concerns, physical diseases, and diagnoses. So this can be helpful if you're looking at um, somatic and physical complaints, for example, FS T equals 80 to 89, possible overreporting of somatic symptoms, and 100 may be valid. Um, this is now reminding me, so again, that general rule of thumb, 65 is high. Again, it doesn't apply to the validity scales. They tend to be less um, internally consistent, which isn't surprising because the construct being assessed is validity, um, which is generally less 
consistent um, construct, but it does mean that there are higher T-scores before you even start to interpret them. FBS was actually developed based on looking for items that are often reported in the context of civil litigation and more so in neuropsychological cases. So it was civil litigation when people were presenting with psychological concerns, PTSD, cognitive concerns, often say after a car accident, for example. So this was developed kind of specifically sort of in the neuropsych case, and thus it tends to reflect over-reporting of both somatic and cognitive or neurological symptoms. Interestingly, um, FS and FBS, oh, I forgot that you can't see where I'm pointing with this version. FS and FBS um, are moderately correlated with each other, but they're not redundant. So one of the nice things about three is it's removed most of the item overlap here in the validity scales as well. And then another score that is actually really unique in the way it was developed for a validity scale all of these others are based specifically on, these are infrequently endorsed. In the case of RBS, or what's called the response bias scale, it was actually looking at items on the MMPI that specifically distinguish people who passed performance validity tests from those who fail performance validity tests. And so this again was in the context of neuropsychology and looking at people who, who uh, were presenting predominantly again with neuropsychological, memory complaints, cognitive complaints, and those who passed uh, highly validated performance validity tests that looked like then that they were uh, performing non-credibly on cognitive measures, measures that were actually assessing their behavior, not self-report. Those who failed it versus those who passed were the MMPI items that distinguish it. So this also tends to be items then that are possible over reporting of like cognitive and neurological kinds of symptoms, T75 to 89 possible overreporting, 90 plus is invalid. So overall on these overreporting scales, as the level of the score increases, you can see that the possibility of overreporting clearly increases, and I've simplified it here, um, all the way to the point of being likely invalid. Um, it is always absolutely crucial for you to then look at the extra test data. So what do I know about this person's psychiatric history? What do I know about their medical history? What do I know about their cognitive history? Um, do they have a history of a head injury, for example? So that you can consider that, you know, to the degree to which this might be over-reporting and also consider not just the level of elevation, but how many of these are elevated when you're kind of considering the overall profile with regard to over-reporting. MMPI also includes under-reporting, Again, the, the classics are L and K. So these uh, tend to be elevated at higher, um, there's a higher base rate of elevations on L and K in settings that you might expect where people would be presenting in the best possible light. So that's not our typical setting. It might be in a forensic setting. It might be in child custody, for example. It might be in personnel decisions or public safety, like police officer evaluations. Could also be possibly indicate a lack of awareness or insight. Um, it also may indicate people who are really coming from a very conventional traditional upbringing. Um, and so they tend to endorse all these kinds of things that are very good, um, or potentially they just really are better adjusted than average. Although given that most of us are working in clinical settings where people are seeking treatment, it would be kind of unusual. So um, the differentiating the causes, as I just, just mentioned, well, you don't know without consent considering extra test data. So what else do you know? What's the context of your evaluation? So really the, the T guidelines here, again, Cliff noted directly from the manual, um, possible underreporting or traditional upbringing versus more likely, or and then all the way to might be invalid. So 80 plus versus 70 plus for K. Um, note that those of you who have been using two and have ne never switched to the RF, um, that K is not used to make K corrections on any scales. It was in that old system. So that is something that disappeared with RF and it definitely does not exist on three. The issue with regard to L and K is if, if you've got evidence of underreporting, you're not going to be able to rely on absence of elevations on any of your clinical scales to rule out problems. So, you know, you may see low profile scores completely throughout it, which could be they have really good adjustment. It could be denial of symptoms or underreporting of symptoms. You might still be able to interpret elevations, but they may be underestimations of the severity of the problem. 
All right, so now let's get to the substantive scales. Um, for each of the substantive scales, which again, we're gonna kind of go through them each, there are different uh, pieces of information that are provided. And there's actually one more set, so let me put it up there. Um, one is the clinical symptoms. So what is it telling you about this person's symptom presentation? And it's divided into two components, the content-based statements, and that's literally the item content for the scale. Remember that unlike two, the RF and now the three are items that make sense in terms of content because the subtle items went away. They did not make empirical sense. They didn't work psychometrically, they're gone. So based on what people are literally reporting on the MMPI, those are the content-based statements um, for interpretation. But the manual also includes what they call empirical correlates. And these are things that were get gathered during validation process. Again, we're gonna talk about them when we talk about interpretation of each scale, but it's important for you to keep track of the difference there. Content-based statements are, they literally reported this because those are the items they endorsed. Empirical correlates are, these are things that a lot of other research shows high scores on these scales likely indicate this. Doesn't necessarily mean that about your client. And that's the difference there. You will also see for each of the substantive scales that there are diagnostic considerations. These two are based on um, somewhat empirical evidence. So the likelihood that a particular diagnosis went along with an elevation, but also on inference. Um, so these are not entirely empirically supported considerations, hence they're not called correlates, they're considerations. And similarly, when it comes to treatment considerations, those are predominantly inferential um, based on uh, research generally, but not specific correlates. As with the 2RF, some of the scales can be interpreted as high or low. As I said, generally, but there are exceptions to the rule, and these are also just heuristics. A T of 65 or higher is elevated, and a T of 38 or lower is low. And often, as you will see, although I'm going to cliff note it here in these slides, you're going to see generally there are often two levels of elevation. One is kind of the theme of the scale in terms of the content-based statements that generally these are the things they report, but then if at a next higher level of elevation, there's often more specific content because it includes maxing out the scale. And so it's very likely they endorse to these items and that then they get increasingly specific. All right, so the higher order scales um, what I have on these sort of cliff notes of the manual are just based on the test responses. So again, this is the item test content for the most part. And the higher order scales came into being with the RF and have continued into the three. And the purpose of them was, was to kind of match with the existing psychopathology research that was showing sort of higher order dimensions of psychopathology that were existing generally in research about psychopathology. Um, and that the MMPI did in fact factor structure in a way that suggested higher order scales. Um, to some extent, they target the three most frequent MMPI two code types for those of you who still are, are two driven. So there's a higher order scale um, that reflects emotional internalizing dysfunction. And that was sort of the 2772 code type. Um, there's a thought dysfunction, higher order scale, and this reflected, again, for those of you who are two driven, the 6886 kind of code type. And then there's the uh, behavioral externalizing um, higher order scale, and this reflects your 49 or 94 code type. Um, but these are not code types. And again, I'm just introducing that for those of you who are making this big leap from two to three. Um, the higher order scales really are truly kind of higher order broadband measures of psychological dysfunction. Um, and you can be elevated on more than one of them. Um, so there's nothing, you know, these aren't orthogonal factors or anything. The issue is these are sort of big dimensions of psychopathology. In fact, you can see the internalizing, externalizing kinds of thing that we know comes through out in child research as well as adult research. Um, to, to kind of conceptualize what to do with these scales, is maybe just think of them more, if, if, you're, if you're a waste user, think of them more like the overall higher order functioning in the domain. So you've got um, VCI and PRI and working memory index and processing speed index, and that's higher order functioning in the domain, but you still should look at the subscales 
to determine the nature of those relationships. Um, and it could be, just as on the, on the WACE, you might have average verbal comprehension index, but in the subscales within that, you might have one that's superior and one that's low average. And similarly, in this higher order within emotional internalizing dysfunction, you still may, it may be that only one of the specific scales that underlie that higher order functioning are highly elevated, or it could be that multiple of them are higher elevated. So to some extent, the higher order scales aren't super useful for you in terms of interpretation. They're just a guidance to domains that seem to be the highest. So a normal score, you know, a score that's not following falling high or low in any of these higher order things doesn't necessarily mean anything. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't look at the other scales because the other scales aren't subscales per se. They're still important to look at. Um, or you could score high on it, and it might be that just one of the underlying um, substantive scales happens to be also high. So what I have not done here um, is to provide you more than just the content-driven, again, cliff note version of the interpretation of them. I did not list all of the empirical correlates, because if you look in the manual, you're going to see a huge list of every possible empirical correlate, and they're basically all the empirical correlates of all the other scales. So it just doesn't make sense. Um, it doesn't make sense for you to list every single one of them, and so I don't have that here. Um, uh, again, the manual makes it clear that your goal here is to use these sort of on guidance as to where the other elevations are and for ordering your report. So which of these three domains seems to be the biggest in terms of a presenting problem for the individual? Um, and because of the profile sheets and the way they're divided up, they have all these higher order scales on the side and then they do the clinical scales. I think that impedes interpretation. So I'm gonna illustrate later how to put these higher order scales together with the other scales and interpret. So what you have here are just simply the test responses, what they typically mean. Again, this will illustrate that two of them you can do low as well as high. So in emotional internalizing dysfunction and behavioral externalizing, you can have low scores that show better than average emotional adjustment or better than average behavioral constraint, whereas the thought dysfunction higher order scale is only interpretable when elevated. And you can see these sort of levels of elevation generally. But then we look at the, the revised clinical scales. Again, this is the has always the clinical scales have always been the basis of interpretation of the MMPI. So here they are. Um, uh, including the new ones. And again, for each one now, you will see that I'm going to mention the test responses. And then in italics, you're going to see some, some of the empirical correlates. Again, I'm not listing them all, but I've kind of shortened them. It's like a cliff notes of the manual itself. But these are not my interpretations. These are taken from the manual. And again, these empirical correlates that are in italics are things that might correlate. They're things that when you look People with high score on these scales tend to or are likely to X, Y, Z. That doesn't mean they're going to apply to every single person with an elevation on that scale. Whereas the other domains are the test responses. The non-italicized pieces are test responses. The other things you're going, you're going to see is um, mention of other scales that you should also look at. Again, that the manual suggests look at these other scales to consider the interpretation. So the first one is demoralization. This one you can do high and low, so less than 39, a higher than average level of morale and life satisfaction versus with increasingly high scores, being sad, unhappy, or having life dissatisfaction. There are many, many empirical correlates, so I'm not gonna list them, but list the scales that the manual says you should look at to see which of those empirical correlates are most salient um, in this person's report. It is especially important, though, when demoralization is high to look at suicidal ideation, particularly when um, you have a high score on the SUI or HLP scales. RC1 um, remains uh, the MMPI scale one that is focused on somatic complaints from the original MMPI all the way forward. Low scores are interpretable, so they indicate physical well-being. Whereas high scores, again, increasingly more specific, multiple somatic complaints. Again, RC1 has many empirical correlates, and so they suggest you need to look at these other substantive scale to provide more detailed information about which kind of domain of, of somatic functioning might be most endorsed. 
RC2 is is renamed again the original name for it um, had to do with depression but this is literally the construct of low positive emotions the seed scale separates it out into this is reflecting individuals at the high end who lack positive emotional experiences who report anhedonia who lack interest low scores though are also interpretable as a high level of psychological well-being feeling confident energetic having emotionally positive experiences what you see in italics then are these are the uh, again cliff note version of the empirical correlates things that are likely to be true about this person um, what's interesting about the rc2 scale and is worth noting and you want to then pay extra care with your trin inconsistency score is that all but one of the items are keyed, keyed in the false direction so you may end up where trin bias could show up specifically on rc2 RC4, no, R RC3 doesn't exist, again, for you, for you, uh, actually, you, you, those of you who use 2 or RF, 3 no longer exists, it's, it's, it's become a cynicism scale, and it's not a revised clinical scale anymore. RC4 is antisocial behavior, again, the seed scale, new name, reflects the construct, can be interpreted low or high, not surprisingly, below average level of past antisocial behavior if it's low, and then significant history of antisocial behavior, and then as the scores get even higher, past and potentially current. Um, the manual points out that this is really best viewed as a history of prior antisocial behavior because most of the items are mentioning the past. So past involvement with the criminal system, or difficulties with authority, conflictual and personal relationships, acting out, all of that sort of thing. There are many empirical correlates though, and so again, this is why you need to be careful and interpret it in the context of some of the other scales. So is this because they had conduct problems as a juvenile? Are they having interpersonal family problems? Are they, that should be SUB, not SUC. Do they have a lot of substance use? RC6, I've um, highlighted in red and to remind myself um, that the scales that have critical content on these slides, I highlighted in red for you. So RC6 is one of the first scales that does have critical content. And again, this has been renamed from paranoia to ideas of persecution. So not interpretable in the low direction, but in the elevated direction, reporting significant persecutory ideation. Um, again, as higher uh, to the level of paranoid delusions. Empirical correlates, again, are listed there. Might not be any surprise what they generally are. Again, for the sake of time, I'm going to keep moving, though, instead of reading them. RC7 can be interpreted high and low. So low scores indicate a below average level of negative emotions, whereas elevated scores suggest report of negative emotions. Again, could be any of them, anxiety, anger, fear, um, but there are many cl clinical correlates. And so the manual points out you don't necessarily, it may be any of these. And so you wanna look specifically at stress and worry and compulsions and anxiety related symptoms and anger proneness and brief restrictive fears to get more at the flavor of what, the, what are the distinct empirical correlates um, and content endorsed by the person. Um, RC8 um, is called aberrant experiences because again, the seed scale interpretation of this is it's not schizophrenia, it's aberrant experiences. Um, not interpretable in the low direction, but in the elevated direction, it's report of unusual thought and perceptual processes empirical correlates certainly do include the possibility of thought disorganization or unrealistic thinking um, scores at 75 or above t score um, it's possible that that it would be linked to auditory or visual hallucinations or delusions um, again those are the empirical correlates um, and the trick with rc8 is is that you want to keep in mind that whether or not they have neurological problems whether or not this is in the context of substance misuse potential cultural interpretations and again so you're going to have to look across scales to interpret that rc9 is hypomanic activation can be interpreted low or high so low scores report a low energy level and so you might need to look back at other indicators of low positive emotions such as two for example um, however high scores are in the direction of reporting um, behaviors and experiences associated with hypo hypomanic activation and the empirical correlates are not um, not a surprise and 
uh, the manual indicates you definitely want to look at some other scales to look at the nature of those likely hypomanic activation symptoms. So the impulsivity scale, the activity scale, aggression, and even cynicism. So those were the clinical scales. And um, then there are specific problem scales that help to interpret these clinical scales. Whoops, I should have known I was already on them. So these are more, the way to view them is they're narrow band facets that are associated with or complement the clinical scales. They're not subscales. They're narrower band facets that are associated with them. So again, this is why you're not, you don't say, oh, because seven isn't elevated, I'm not going to care about anything that, that looks like it is a facet of seven. It's not the same thing. You still wanna look at these specific problem scales. Um, so mostly, they certainly can facilitate the interpretation of elevations on the RC scales because of that broad pattern of empirical correlates. Um, and the overall pattern of elevations on these can help you with interpretation. But they fall into domains that you might expect, as well as two that aren't reflected in, in higher order, the higher order scales or the, the clinical scales per se. There's the somatic cognitive domain. RC1 is, is a piece of that, but not all of it. There's the internalizing domain. And so there are facets that go with demoralization and facets that go with RC7. The externalizing domain, there's facets that go with RC4 and facets that go with RC9. And then there's the interpersonal specific problems domain that don't really have a clinical scale necessarily that go with them. So again, I, I, what I have here are cliff notes. For each of them, you're going to see, can we interpret it low or high? Um, what are sort of the cliff notes, um, uh, uh, problem statements that are literally based on the content of the scale versus what are the empirical correlates are in italics. So this kind of serves as a cliff note of the manual. So to kind of quickly skim those scales before we take um, our next break, um, malaise. Um, malaise is interpretable high or low. If it's low, then you're reporting generalized well-being, but if it's high, you're reporting kind of general malaise, poor health, feeling weak or tired. Um, and so empirical correlates not, are not surprising. Sleep, sleep is one that's related to it, sleep and fatigue, but also low energy, sexual dysfunction, poor health generally. In the other parts of somatic cognitive, they're a little more specific. So neurological complaints, again, interpretable only high. So reporting vague neurological complaints. Eating concerns is new. This was not on the RF. This is based on new item content. And this is interpretable only at 75 or higher. So you can see I put red there just to call your attention to it. And the reason is this scale did show less internal consistency. So higher standard error of measurement, not, in, not really interpretable, at least heuristically until 75 rather than 65, where, and, and not interpretable in the direction of low. So reporting problematic eating behaviors and the empirical correlates are um, concern about weight or body shape and restricted eating or loss of control about eating. So that's a newer scale. COG is also new to the RF and so was Nuke. So those of you who are two users, um, many of these scales won't look familiar, but could be very useful to you. COG is the report of cognitive complaints. Um, it's important to note because I see this problem all the time, um, both in our clinic as well as um, in some of the ex external consulting work that I do, that people report that, the, that people have cognitive impairment based on this scale. No, this is cognitive complaints. They're reporting a diffuse pattern of cognitive difficulties. Doesn't mean that they have those problems. Um, and the empirical correlates are related to having those problems. It is recommended that then you, you access extra test data, potentially refer for a neuropsych assessment if people have these complaints, but it doesn't mean they have cognitive impairment. In the internalizing camp, um, particularly if we're focused on the demoralization facets, we have suicidal ideation, helplessness, um, uh, uh, self-doubt, and in, inefficiency, ineffectiveness. Note that uh, suicidal death ideation and helplessness hopelessness are red. That's because they're critical item scales. And note that in the self-doubt domain that I highlighted the 78. And the reason I did that is you should be able to see on all the other scales 
that when I'm talking about elevations, it'll say things like 80 plus or 79 plus. That means it's plus up to some other higher number. But if it doesn't say plus in these scales or in this in these uh, PowerPoints, it means that that's the maximum high score you can get. So I've highlighted that because I want to remind you of the importance of looking under the hood of all tests. And when you computerize, when you give a computerized test, you forget to do that. So you might see that self-doubt t equals 78 and think, well, that's not that high. That's the max you can get. That's endorsing all the items. So um, it is high for self-doubt. Um, so you always want to get under the hood of your test and look back and see what what is true about those domains. And the way I've shortened it here is if it doesn't say plus, then that's the max score that you can get. So again, critical items um, on this particular set, the only one that can be interpreted high versus low is inefficiency. So someone who have a low score reports feeling decisive and efficacious versus those who have a high score. Again, for each one, you're going to see um, what some of the empirical correlates are and, um, and the fact that there are some other scales you should consider to interpret it. The other thing to note about suicidal ideation, it was interpretable at 58 or higher. Um, 58 is endorsing one item. So if they at all say um, that they ever had any sort of suicidal or death ideation, the scale is gonna show as elevated. So it, it, and because that's critical item content, it's gonna encourage you to look. So that de the demoralization facets are uh, suicidal ideation, helplessness, self-doubt, and inefficiency. Um, the, um, the seven facets are stress, worry, and compulsivity. Um, uh, notice that uh, worry and compulsivity are new to three. So those of you who are used to the RF, they all kind of fell together and they've separated them out. Again, I highlighted under compulsivity, the 62 is in red because it can be interpreted at 62 and above, not 65 and above. And both stress and worry can be interpreted low in addition to high. So low average level of, below average level of stress or below average level of worry. Um, again, some of the empirical correlates are listed here and they're more specific as you'll see when you read through them than they were for the, the clinical scales. Additional RC7 facets of the internalizing domain, anxiety-related experiences, anger proneness, and behavior-restricting fears. Um, so again, slightly new from the RF, they've separated out some components of, of anxiety, stress, and worry from each other, and they don't have multiple restricting fears, they only have behavior-restricting fears. So in this case, only anxiety-related experiences interpret a low and high, and so low below average levels of anxiety related experiences versus increasingly high levels. Anxiety related experiences is now such a narrow construct that it is really related to specific anxiety disorders, anxiety related problems, sleep difficulties, possible PTSD. The higher it gets, it might even be disassociation, but then you look at RC8 to help you there. Anger proneness um, and behavior restricting fears, um, again, pure and more narrow constructs related to RC7. If we wander off to the externalizing scales, um, the RC4 facets are family problems, juvenile conduct problems, and substance abuse. Um, only family problems is interpretable low, and that means you've had a contract conflict-free past and current family environment versus if it's high, conflictual family relationships or lack of family support. Um, juvenile conduct problems, again, are history of these problems, not necessarily current. And then substance use, again, it could be past and current abuse. The higher it gets suggests that there's current use, um, uh, um, including multiple substances. Um, then when we look at the scales that are more related to um, RC9 facets, we get impulsivity, that's a new scale, activation, aggression, and then cynicism is what's left over from scale three from the original MMPI that also was still, still kind of scale three on the RF. So impulsivity, activation, and cynicism can be interpreted low as well as high. Again, that, that is a big difference for you MMPI2 users, um, but not surprisingly, impulsivity when high ind indicates re you're reporting and engaging in a lot of problematic impulsive behavior. Um, 
activation. If you're increasingly high, you're reporting heightened activation and energy levels. It might be uncontrollable. You might have lack of sleep when the scores are even higher. Aggression, um, high only, physically aggressive, violent behavior, or losing control, increasingly of concern as it's more elevated. And then cynicism, which again is, is a newer scale. At the low levels, you are describing others as well-intentioned and trustworthy. You say that you don't have cynical beliefs about people. You might be overly trusting. Whereas at high levels, you have cynical beliefs about people. And then that domain of interpersonal problems, self-importance, dominance, are two major new scales um, to all of us. Um, so self-importance as low means you lack positive qualities. If there are high scores, it means they're reporting having special talents, abilities, brilliant ideas. They consider themselves superior or extraordinary. Dominance, again, low or high. If they report low scores, they report being passive, submissive, not being in charge. Versus if they're high, they have strong opinions, they're assertive, they're direct. They report being able to lead others, although one of the empirical correlates is others will view them as overly assertive or domineering. Again, in the interpersonal domain, we have disaffiliative, disaffiliativeness, social avoidance, and shyness. Those will look familiar to the, those of you who use the RF. Um, disaffiliativeness only interpreted as elevated, so reporting disliking people, being around them, preferring to be alone. Social avoidance and, social, and shyness, both interpretable as low or high. For social avoidance, reporting enjoying social situations and events when it's low, and reporting not enjoying social events and avoiding social situations when it's high. For shyness, a low score would be little social anxiety, and a high score would be shy, embarrassed, uncomfortable around others. And that's the end of the main scales. Sci-5 still does exist. And again, we'll take a break right after the Sci-5 scales um, because there's only five of them. So aggressiveness, um, this is interpretable high or low. And again, Sci-5 is meant to be more temperamental, more chronic trait-based kinds of symptoms. So a low score means that in general, this person reports being unassertive. If they have 65 plus scores, they report that they do tend to engage in instrumentally aggressive behavior. Um, they're empirical correlates. They're likely overly assertive, socially dominant, likely to engage in instrumentally aggressive behavior, may be viewed by others as domineering. The psych scale or psychoticism is only interpretable in the elevated direction. Again, reports a tendency generally to report unusual beliefs and perceptions. Also, though, alienation from others is, is an empirical correlate. The Psi-5 scale of disconstraint generally can be interpreted low or high. A low score is overly constrained behavior, whereas a high score is uh, generally engaging in disconstrained behavior. Neg E, um, negative emotionality and neuroticism can be interpreted low or high. A low score means you're not prone to experiencing negative emotions, whereas a high score means you have a tendency to generally experience negative emotionality. And then introversion or low positive emotionality, a low score means that you tend to have a, a wide range of positive emotions and are socially engaged, whereas a high score means you lack those positive emotions and also tend to avoid social situations. So again, these are more broad-based, temperamental uh, than, than the specific um, problem scales or the revised clinical scales. Um, for those of you who are wondering, the interest scales do not exist on the three. And for those of you who used the two, the interest scales were actually what was left of scale five, um, uh, the male-female scale. So those have vanished completely. All, all of those kind of gender stereotypes have, have vanished from, from this instrument. But even without the interest scales, that's a lot of scales. And it can be really overwhelming for you to consider them all. Um, but the manual does recommend a structure for interpretation and report writing that should aid you. But this is probably a good time for a break um, so that we can come back and talk through the handout. So on our break, make sure you have um, the handout um, that shows you kind of the interpretive method. Um, and we'll do a couple of cases and illustrate it. So Megan, hopefully you're still there. Yes. <laughs> 
Yeah, right. Thank you. All right. Thank That's you. That's a great time That's for a 10-minute break, so we'll come back at 2.10.
Okay, Julie, are you back and ready? I'm here. All right. All right. Um, for those who didn't see, I was finally able to add the worksheet into the chat. So if you did not receive it by email, hopefully you can access it and download it there. And you will need it. This is the time to pull it up on your screen or print a copy or have it handy. So we're going to launch into the handout. So if you glance at it real quickly, you will see that there's various steps and we're going to talk you through them, but you will also see all of these little tables and the tables reflect the recommendations of the manual for the flow for interpretation of this instrument. So there's nothing magical about this interpretive worksheet. It's literally my way of taking the manual and turning it into something that makes it easier for me to integrate all the tests together. And if you don't believe me, uh, you can refer yourself to page 28 of the manual because it is the recommended structure and sources of information. And what you will see is all the little scales that are off to the side are the ones that are showing up on this interpretive worksheet. So, um, so that's what it's there for, and we're going to talk through it. Um, uh, and the flow, for, as the manual recommends, is not surprisingly, you should always start with validity. <laughs> you, you absolutely need to start with validity because if it turns out this is an invalid protocol, why would you go any further? You're done interpreting the test. And they divide it into the non-responsive and inconsistent uh, validity evidence versus the under-reporting or over-reporting. And that, that, that becomes then the, the, the way in which you need to consider whether the whole protocol is invalid or whether or not by virtue of under-reporting this individual, the scores may be underestimates or in fact lack of elevations may not be particularly interpretable, or if there's over-reporting, whether or not all the scales are elevated because of over-reporting. Then the manual recommends you interpret the various substantive scales in the five areas and you will see the five areas on the worksheet. So somatic cognitive scales, emotional dysfunction scales, part one, which are the RCD facets, emotional dysfunction scales, part two, which is the RC7 facets, behavioral dysfunction, interpersonal dysfunction, um, and thought dysfunction, which is actually not five areas, one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, and what the manual recommends is, okay, for this particular person, if I'm gonna write up their report, I'm going to do the area that has the most elevation. So what I have is just, here they are in order on the basis of the, um, the table I just referred you to that was in the manual. But once I have this all filled out in my worksheet, I can look at whichever one is the most prominent in the protocol when I'm writing it up, then I can start with the one that's most prominent and meaningful. And then the manual suggests um, talking about diagnostic and treatment considerations sort of as its as its own piece. But we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, with regard to critical items, the manual also reminds you to pay attention to those. Again, these are items whose contents been judged to be indicative of serious psychopathology. The critical items show up on critical scales, um, which are identified. But the nice thing about a computerized interpretation, too, is that it will just go ahead and give you a separate sheet that shows all the critical items that were endorsed. Now, it's important, the manual mentions, it doesn't mean that you can just take the critical items and that somehow that will tell you something about the individual's adjustment. That's not what they're meant to do. And it's not reliable to take the critical items as some sort of scale or even one individual critical item as though it is a scale because we can misinterpret a single item. There, there's just, there's no validity to taking, they endorsed one item true or false and have that be meaningful. Really what you should do with them um, in a valid profile is endorsement of a critical item, you should inquire further. It means pay attention to this. I should find more information out about the nature of this symptom that they endorsed. Again, we already covered some of this most of the scales generally are interpreted as higher than 65 or lower than 39. There are some exceptions. For example, compulsivity was an exception. Suicidality is an exception. But again, they're heuristic guidelines, not rigid demarcation rules. And as I pointed out before, you also can 
for your specific kind of setting or the specific kind of presentation for that individual, go to the technical manual and look at the means and standard deviations of all the scaled scores, including the validity scales for different populations. Um, and they have not only the normative sample is what you get in the profile sheet, but they have outpatient community mental health, outpatient private practice, um, very specific kinds of referral questions like sex addiction treatments, spinal cord or spine surgery candidates, um, they have a lot of forensic settings like forensic disability, prison inmates, police candidates, corrections officer candidates, dispatcher candidates, so a lot of personnel stuff. They also have college counseling, they have college students generally. So depending on your setting, you might find some, some useful um, data that can better help you decide what the nature of the score means for the individual you're assessing. Um, again, the test responses versus empirical correlates. Come back and, and, and make this point even more salient with regard to how you write it up. So those test responses are content-based. They're based on the item of the content. The person's endorsing them, therefore they're endorsing this kind of content. And so how the manual suggests that you write about that is uh, X reports this, or X describes themselves as, or X does not report this, or X reports no symptoms of. Um, I'm going to emphasize those last two points because what many people forget is you can also comment when there's not something that is being endorsed on this scale. That's really important when you think about extra test correlates. If somebody is describing themselves in the interview in a particular way and then you give them an MMPI and you're not seeing elevations or maybe even seeing low scores, in, in domains that you would expect might be elevated, it's, it's worth noting that. Um, so you always want to think about the fact that this is telling you more than what they are endorsing, it's also telling you what they're not endorsing. Again, the clinical correlates then are the list of clinical correlates that are more likely with unusually high or unusually low scores. Those are based on data where people who have elevations on this tend to have this. It doesn't mean that every single correlate applies to all people who have elevated scores on that scale. And so again, you shouldn't consider them in isolation of other scales or in isolation of other knowledge about, the, about that particular person you're evaluating. So when you're writing about the, the clinical correlates, you can say things like X is likely at risk for, or X may have a history of, or X is likely to experience because they are empirical correlates, clinical correlates, they're not content-based. So you'll want to separate those out, and in the illustrations that I'll show you, I, I did so. So in order to use my visual interpretive method, again, this is the manual turned into two pages uh, with some tables to try to help you integrate together all these scales in a way that's completely based on the manual. So you will see step one is record all the T-scores in the appropriate boxes. So if you glance just as an example, on the, on the um, handout to the validity scales. You will see that the name of the scale appears in the middle, and then there are boxes across the top, boxes across the bottom. And, and in fact, for the validity scales, you will see that most of the boxes across the bottom are also X'd out. So what you're putting is any score at above 50 T, you can write above the scale name, and 49 or, 49 or below, you can write under. But if the box is X'd out, there's no point in write, writing the low score because it can't be interpreted in that direction. So I just made it that much easier for you to say, okay, then I know I don't have to interpret that scale. It's X'd out, it's not interpretable in that direction. But I do encourage you to write all the scores where the boxes are blank, because again, with this um, heuristic rule of, okay, it may or may not be elevated, but it might be close, this way you have all your scale scores and you can kind of look at that. Um, uh, although I don't have this right here in this spot, you will see that the other thing that appears are footnotes. Um, uh, those footnotes are again taken directly from the manual. So if a high score, um, if you look under F, it has a one and a two, for example. So if F is elevated because they're, the, it's the one and the two are above the score, then you need to rule out inconsistency as an explanation. Well, that's easy to do. I can look right back at the inconsistent items are there. Two, if uh, the footnote for two says, interpret all substantive scales cautiously, possibly invalid, depending on the level of elevation. So the footnotes, and I guess I should call them headnotes and footnotes, um, are in the direction of the elevation. 
and will help you to integrate the scales across these different domains. Um, and again, taken straight from the manual. Um, in step two, items with critical content have an asterisk next to them, and so you would want to look at specific items if the scales are elevated. So for that, you have to flip to the other, the second page, you will see like SUI has two asterisks around it, HLP, two asterisks around it. Those are the critical item scales so that you know to pay attention to them. Um, so in step three, highlight all the scales that are clinically interpretable per the manual. You could also use these handouts because the cliff notes show you what are the high scores on all these domains. So you could go through and highlight those. And now you know, okay, which ones are considered elevated? Then in step four, you can use this visual and the manual to help you integrate the results and conceptualize the case. So the groupings that I've made here, again, are consistent with the manual suggestions for interpretation, and the footnotes tell you the cross-domain scale combinations that might have clinical meaning. So for example, um, scale nine, which if you look is under the behavioral dysfunction scales, it's about halfway through the middle, um, of that table, it says RC9. And what you should see is that for a low score, there's a footnote for four. And if you look down at the footnote for four, it says CRC2. And that's because the manual says, oh, when RC9 is low, you might want to consider RC2 because RC9 low is very low activation and an elevation on RC2, which is low positive emotions, those would go together. So, so it would be good for you to look across these sets to help you integrate together the meaning and, and potentially the um, interpretation overall in the empirical correlates. But if you have a high score on RC9, then you have three footnotes, three, five, and six. So for three, it tells you to look at RC6 and RC8 because high activation may also occur in the context of psychotic symptoms or um, uh, so RC6 is up, that's paranoia, RC8 is the unusual perceptions and experiences. Perhaps this is an, uh, a high activation in the course of, of a, a acute episode of psychosis. But you also see the footnote for five and the footnote for five says, look at impulsivity, activity, aggression, and cynicism. That might be more a flavor where nine is highly activated and the person's also kind of out of control so more like a hypomanic state and then for six the footnote six says look at um, sfi and, and dom so is this somebody who's highly activated and also very domineering um, and very very assertive so it again gives you a little bit of cross domain scale combinations that empirical data suggests do have different meanings to some extent these are sort of the remaining remnants of of the idea of code types, but it's really these scales in concert have different meanings. Again, another example is on here too, that the combination of um, nuke, shy, and cynicism are important to examine because it, you would interpret it differently. Um, but there aren't a lot of these cross-domain scale combinations, at least as of yet. I think as data on the three grows, we'll find some more because there were some on the RF that I would have expected to see on here and that aren't. So they must not have, have risen to the empirically supported evidence of that combination yet. Again, keeping in mind these cutoffs are heuristic, so close may be meaningful. Okay, so then step five again, well, what would, when I'm putting this all together, what am I gonna do in my report? So again, first always consider the validity. You just don't wanna interpret if it's not valid, but if you're gonna interpret with caution, you wanna make that clear throughout the report. Don't just say, I should interpret this with caution and then list all of the content and empirical correlates without reminding the reader that you need to think about this with caution. Um, again, uh, separating out the idea of test responses that are the item content, so this person reports versus the clinical correlates that they likely have something. Always remember to also consider what's not elevated because that helps inform the overall package. Um, Again, when considering the test responses, empirical correlates, diagnostic and treatment considerations, also considering extra test data. So at this point now, these are sort of my recommendations um, because you should always consider extra test data. So when things are not consistent at all with other evidence that I have, I typically would add in consistent with their psychiatric history, X reported blah or if it's not, although X denied Y during the clinical interview, their MPI responses suggest they are at risk for 
something. So I tend to do that when I write up um, my, my MMPI interpretations because I'm constantly remembering I'm an assessor and not just a tester. Also for diagnostic considerations, my own approach is not to list every single diagnostic consideration that's under the empirical correlates, because again, that doesn't make sense. Some of them I may have already ruled out. They're literally there as diagnostic considerations. It doesn't necessarily mean they know to go in the interpretation. So I don't tend to include them in the write-up of the MMPI results. I put them in my diagnostic impression section together with the extra test data. So if there's uh, if the history and the interview responses and the behavioral presentation and their MMPI scores suggest there's a, this is a diagnostic consideration, then that's where I will put them. If you choose to have them in the test results, though, again, you want to consider whether you're just listing all of them or whether you're actually truly considering them. You don't just put everything in your report. You put your conclusions. And that's why I always like using these kinds of worksheets. It gives me a chance to consider and then write the bottom line. Um, similarly, for treatment considerations, again, in my opinion, these are all inferential. They are not empirical correlates. They are kind of inferential ideas. And so I would include that just in my treatment re recommendations section of the integrated report, along with any other extra test data that might inform approach to treatment or barriers to treatment, et cetera. So again, a few of those last points are in my opinion pieces, whereas the rest of this is all informed by the manual. All right, let's do a couple of cases. Again, keep your handbook or your handout handy because I lifted sections of it for each of these cases. I have two cases that we'll get through in the time that remains. Um, and note that I've de-identified some aspects of the case just to protect the data, but not the major clinical characteristics relevant to the case. Um, because again, three's only been out for a few months. We started using it um, in early February. I don't have a lot of cases, but I wanted to, again, de-identify to the degree that I could. So the first individual, um, again, the nature of our, our clinic, this is our, our um, psychology and social work clinic. We get a lot of referrals for evaluation um, for the question of ADHD. We end up doing very comprehensive evaluations on them. So I have a lot of quote unquote extra test data to go with these MMPI profiles. Um, uh, so this is a 29-year-old graduate student who identified as male and white and had been referred by uh, his therapist for the question of ADHD. So what I've done for each of these is I'm, I'm kind of lifting the hand out piece by piece so you can see these different tables. Again, best if you just kind of follow along them. So you can kind of see, oh, here's here's the all the validity scales. What I've done is put them on this on the sheet and highlighted the ones that were clinically interpretable. And if there were footnotes, unfortunately, because I did it sort of tried to do a cut and paste, it took the footnotes off. So you'll have to look on your handbook handout and you'll see, okay, here's the numbers that went with these. So for this individual, their validity scale profile showed a, a low score on CRIN and a high score, a, an elevated score on F and RBS. So when we look at the um, correlates of that, the F correlates, again, are rule out inconsistency as an explanation. Well, we can rule that out because in this case, uh, CRIN suggests they're showing highly consistent responding. So we don't see elevations on F or RBS because they were also inconsistent. Um, the elevation on F is why the footnote two is highlighted, interpret all the substantive scales cautiously, it's possibly invalid depending on the level of elevation. And then for RBS, it includes the uh, footnote four, which is interpret the cognitive scales cautiously, possibly invalid depending on the level of elevation. And an 87 is pretty elevated. So what we have is in red, my integration of here's what was listed as the, the um, interpretation of these scales, consistent responding, possible overreporting, especially of cognitive symptoms, interpret especially cognitive scales with caution. So we need to think about that moving forward with the rest of the profile. Now with regard to the actual um, uh, presentation of this client, that's always going to show up in blue on these slides. What we had was in fact um, that this individual failed multiple indicators of over-reporting on an additional measure. 
So, um, so we saw other evidence of overreporting, and in maxed out their report on a couple of other self-report scales, um, the Barclay um, Deficits and Executive Function Scale and the Barclay Functional Impairment Scale, and and extra chest correlates. This was somebody who was very highly functional, did very very well up until basically COVID. Um, not surprisingly. We're giving the MMPI three during COVID. So COVID is a context for a lot, <laughs> for both of these cases. So this individual is really struggling with graduate work during COVID, but had been highly functional prior to that. And so it did not make sense that they would max every single item on measures of executive impairment or just, just functional impairment generally. Um, so that again, RBS is that unusual validity scale that was based on items that empirically distinguish people who failed performance validity tests versus who passed them. And because of COVID and telehealth, we are very limited in what performance validity tests we can give. We can only give symptom validity tests and the performance validity tests we have are highly insensitive. They're, they're actually not great measures. And so this person did pass the PVTs that we gave, but failed other SVTs. So not surprisingly, our, our data on the client, this kind of makes sense. So if we look just within the somatic cognitive domain, um, again, I put all the scores in. There's not a score given for EAT. And the reason is that the score was below a T of 50 and the box is X'd out. So there's no reason to even consider that score. It's, it's not an elevation. Um, and it's not interpretable in the low direction. So uh, the, again, the red is what the manual says are the complaints what's what's likely to be the complaints of this individual complaints of significant malaise being tired weak incapacitated likely to report sleep difficulties and fatigue and also reported a diffuse pattern of cognitive difficulties but this should be interpreted with caution given the validity scales so remember because rbs was elevated as was f so what do we know about the client there's a lot of information here but again we've got somebody who reported difficulties with focus for the past several years, but that they increased during COVID. Um, but the complaints really all had to do with getting that dissertation done, being disorganized, being forgetful, losing track of what they're talking about or what others are saying to them, getting fixated on your dissertation work and going down a rabbit hole without with too much focus on a small detail, had been doing fine, did fine through school, strong in their STEM classes, um, you know, looking back in time, felt like maybe they hadn't put in their full work, maybe didn't have great study habits, but no history they'd ever done poorly, AB student all the way through to the doctoral program, um, as is often the case in, in, in our, those who present here, said that at one point, one teacher described him as disruptive, but again, that's not history of impairment, and that it was because he was bored um, with the work um, the, he had, finished his work early and disrupted other students. Um, so feeling like he was getting taken off task by the slightest distractions during COVID um, with regard to um, sleep, because one of the empirical correlates of a malaise indicator is likely to report sleep difficulties. Uh, indeed, the client reported getting eight hours of sleep, but reported that I was restless sleep, never felt well rested when getting up, often tired throughout the day. Um, also reporting sometimes difficulty um, falling asleep, even up to an hour to fall asleep due to various anxious thoughts and ruminating. Um, did not report any notable medical history per se. And again, we don't have elevation on RC1. Um, so malaise is a nice capture of this. We do see a lot of elevations in emotional dysfunction, particularly demoralizing and the facets associated with it. So you can see here that we've got basically highlight, all of them are highlighted. Every single score is elevated, um, uh, sometimes quite substantially. So again, the higher order EID scale is at a T of 86. And so clearly there's a lot going on in this internalizing um, emotional dysfunction category. And we see that it's kind of across the board, high demoralization. Um, suicide was only at T equals 58, so one item was endorsed, but helplessness is right at T of 65, self-doubt is quite high, NFC is high, RC2 is quite elevated, 
and even the introversion sci-fi scale is elevated. So what you have, again, that's why I put this tables this way, the manual suggests these all go together. So why not have them there rather than a clinical profile sheet that has them all on different pages? These things should go together and this will help you look at them in an integrative fashion. So, um, so we do see that um, I didn't, I should have highlighted the footnote for one because that's the EID one that specifically says for specific interpretation of elevations here, you need to look at all the others. Um, but because SUI is high and demoralization is high, um, you should be paying attention to all of these other elevations. Um, again, the highlight for four is because um, for RC2, you need to pay attention to the trend false responding um, when that score is high because of the direction that all the items are keyed. So again, the highlights are meant to illustrate what you should pay attention to. Um, uh, and when we look then at the content as well as the empirical correlates, you'll see that in red. So reporting considerable emotional distress, including feeling demoralized, having both low positive emotions and high negative emotions because we've got D and two. Um, reports feeling unhappy and overwhelmed, depressed and hopeless um, hopeless, pessimistic about his future, reports a history of suicidal ideation and maybe it increased for suicidal ideation, uh, reports negative feelings about himself, lacking confidence, feeling worthless and in, in efficacious, is likely to be passive, indecisive, so now we're in the correlates, is likely to be passive, indecisive and lack perseverance, likely to be ruminative, likely to lack interest, anhedonia and likely to report low energy. So in blue, what, what is that consistent with in terms of the client's presentation? Um, the client did report sadness and hopelessness that he was going to get nowhere with his research or his career. Um, a lot of worry about what others think about him, whether he looks like an idiot, often called himself that. Um, persistent, difficult, negative thoughts about himself, um, considered himself worthless, reported a lot of self-hatred. Um, again, saying he felt like an idiot. Um, described himself as the biggest piece of SHIT in the world, um, reporting that he, in, in sort of a ruminative sense, he goes back to things that he had done before in his research or his writing and discovered all the mistakes he makes, typos, et cetera, blames himself for them. Um, in the sense of no positive emotions right now, he did not report any hobbies or activities that he used to enjoy. He's not engaging in any of them. He doesn't do any exercise. His only activities were working on his dissertation and then just kind of passively watching television or video games. So we did see a lot of report of negativity, particularly about himself and his ability to accomplish things and helplessness and hopelessness. Um, and he did report um, some very passive suicidal ideation and none current. Um, so uh, the red and the blue, by the way, are um, you know to help you see what I'm doing with this particular case. However, when I use this worksheet, this is literally what I do. I pull up that worksheet, I you know, save a copy to go with the client, I put in all the scores and highlight everything, and then I use the manual and I type in what are all the, the um, content-based interpretations that might be suggested, what are the empirical correlates that might be suggested, and then I look back and say, okay, and what's going on with this client? How does this all make sense? which kinds of empirical correlates keep showing up in every one of these scales that, oh, wow, this really seems to be quite true about that person and where is it consistent? And then I use this worksheet to help me write the integrated bottom line report. So this is not unlike what I would be doing with this worksheet, but it's a little bit more illustrative of the, the client. So you can kind of see how the scale matches this client. Um, not surprisingly, the other domain of emotional internalizing dysfunction also shows a lot of elevations. So this is what gets called the RC7 facets in the manual. And again, we see a lot of elevations. Um, uh, again, I should have highlighted one because that's the RC7 elevation where it says, make sure you look at all of these to help interpret it. But in fact, we do see stress is up, worry is up, not compulsions, but anxiety related experiences up, anger proneness is up, and then this temperamental negative emotionality psi five scale is also elevated. Um, so uh, the individual reports high negative emotions in particular, high levels of stress, feeling nervous, excessive worry and generalized anxiety, also reports getting upset easily, being impatient with others and easily angered. 
in terms of empirical correlates, likely to be overcome with anger at times, likely to have low frustration tolerance. So I have a lot more blue here because this was a domain that the, that the client reported a great deal about, a lot of stress and worry um, that led to racing thoughts, that made the client spiral, made it very difficult to focus. So some of the cognitive concerns were related to anxiety. Um, uh, the client reported, especially during, and some of you grad students are gonna really feel a lot of empathy with this client, especially during the entire time in his graduate program, a lot of anxiety about uncertainty, um, dealing with advisors being too handoff approach to mentoring, leaving him feeling stressed or in limbo when he turns things in, doesn't think they're good enough. Um, although a lot of it was about the graduate program, he also reported worries more generally, um, called them random things that don't matter, but that really from a content standpoint were self-disparaging. Um, worrying again, that would be good enough, going to be an outcast kinds of things. So stress and worry were definitely there. Also reported um, um, more on the um, maybe ARX kind of components, feeling on edge, um, although this was especially in social situations. Again, we're going to see that show up later in the profile. So anytime he had to be around new people, if he had to make a phone call, if he had to meet someone new, even if he was approaching someone he knew, but they were standing in a group of people he didn't know, he would feel very much on edge. Um, again, some more worries, future, dissertation, money, um, even though he described himself as frugal and, and didn't actually objectively have money problems. Um, said that he could very easily talk himself out of things, especially social engagements with others, because he worries about what they're going to think about him or that pe people who are unfamiliar to him would, would think he's weird. Um, and again, massive fear of failure at the start of the PhD program. So we've got a lot of stress, a lot of worry. Um, with regard to physiological anxiety symptoms, did report racing heart, muscle tension, hyperventilation, shaking, being sweaty, especially when his anxiety is very high, and also finding himself being fidgety, picking at his fingernails, being more restless when he's stressed. Like he has to use his, his more agitated energies that are related to being anxious. Um, did not report outright panic attacks, although that is an empirical correlate of high scores on ARCs, um, but he's at T equals 66. Um, so you can get a lot bigger elevation on, on the ARC scale. Um, but he did say if he's having a high emotion conversation with somebody, he will just have, his mind will go completely blank. And so he's having these physiological anxiety symptoms and then also kind of a cognitive reaction. Um, he also, consistent with the anger proneness elevation, reported that he struggles with irritability and gave several examples of his having little patience, even for a small stressor, like say a car was going too slowly in front of him, he might get so angry or frustrated and he would hold that for a few hours, like he couldn't let it go. So again, this combination of, of high negative emotionality tied with stress and worry and physical anxiety, but also kind of irritability, anger proneness, it, it, these elevations make sense. So we've got a lot of stuff going on in the internalizing camp, both low positive, emotions and self-disparaging and high negative emotions. This also is very consistent with, with, with the client because there's not a lot of elevations here. So the over, higher order, order scale on BXD is not elevated. Um, antisocial or the antisocial behavior scale is not elevated. Um, we see family problems is barely elevated at T equals 65. Nothing else is in an elevated interpretable direction. And FML, family problems, the, the manual says this is someone who reports lack of family support or conflict and familial relationships. And consistent with this, the client did um, uh, report some problems with his family, some major conflicts with his father in particular, viewed his father as emotionally abusive and controlling. Um, mostly maintains his difference from them now because he feels like um, he's now the outcast in the family because he had gone to therapy to try to address, not aggress, but address his anger and interpersonal difficulties with his family members. He at some point had tried to kind of confront his father and felt like his um, other family members sided with his father and not him. So he was feeling kind of lack of support. This family conflict makes sense. 
He did report prior social use of marijuana and alcohol, although not often and only socially. He'd been avoiding alcohol since August of 2020. Um, he did report one prior time that he'd had a, a, a fine community service and a fine because he was, had public intox. Um, but his JCP score or his sub score isn't up. I was just giving you the rest of the context for things that are consistent with behavioral dysfunction, dysfunction from his history standpoint. In the interpersonal dysfunction scales, um, again, those of you who are used to the RF, this probably wasn't going to surprise you that there are some scales we want to pay attention to. Um, we see elevations on um, uh, socially avoidant and the, um, the highlight on the two, the footnote two is what goes with socially avoidant. And that's because you want to look at shy, which again is elevated for him, but also self-doubt and ineffectiveness. If you remember, those were very highly elevated for this client. He's also low on um, viewing himself in a positive way, which suggests he's not viewing himself in a positive way. And that probably doesn't surprise you given how he described himself earlier. So um, we can integrate this sort of social component together with those elevations that we saw in internalizing because we're seeing that there is a lot of this internalizing, um, lack of positive qualities, and then also these negative emotions that are tied to the social context. And we already saw those were empirical correlates of those other scales, and now we're seeing it in these narrow interpersonal dysfunction scales as well. He's describing himself as lacking any positive qualities and describing himself as not enjoying social events, avoiding social situations, being introverted, sky, or introverted shy, uncomfortable around others, likely to have troubles forming close relationships, being socially inhibited and socially awkward. And this is how he described himself. He was bullied in school. He felt socially awkward. He was teased for being smarter. He occasionally fought back. Um, he Once he got into uh, college and had people who shared his major, which, which is a STEM major, he made friends, but then he lost touch with them. Once he went on to school and they went on to real lives, he doesn't make attempts to contact them because he thinks they would find his life boring and they've moved on with life and he would be a burden. Um, so he does have a supportive current significant other, but he really doesn't engage with people. And again, he feels on edge about them. He tries to avoid those contacts and social engagements with others. So we saw a lot of those kinds of things reflected also in the correlates of um, the internalizing scales, but now we see there is a heavy social context here. Thought dysfunction scales are not elevated, so we don't need to talk about those much. So in this individual's case, um, together the MMPI, together with what he reported in interview, together with some other self-report scales and, and behavioral observations, he did meet criteria for generalized anxiety disorder, but also social anxiety disorder. And he met criteria for major depressive disorder recurrent in partial remission. Did the MMPI tell us that? No, the MMPI told us the nature of some of these constructs that go together with this that were consistent with who we saw and what he reported about his history, et cetera. Um, now, this individual was coming from a therapist and doing some non-specific sort of social interventions. And so our recommendation was that to continue therapy, but maybe a little bit more focus on the social anxiety. And because that wasn't a focus, and he agreed that was a priority at feedback, that, that this, these interpersonal issues were like to, likely to interfere with his, you know, finding a job later. And we also recommended some more focus on behavioral activation due to low motivation and anhedonia components, and perhaps some CBTI to, to address his sleep because he really had a very inconsistent sleep schedule and reported some symptoms of insomnia, although not diagnosable. Um, so those were sort of the main, um, the priority sorts of uh, uh, recommendations we had in terms of also the diagnoses, um, which the MMPI informed. All right, case two in our remaining uh, 10 minutes or so. 24 year old college senior identified as white and non-binary referred um, themselves due to concerns that they may have ADHD. Again, we'll get straight into the scales and I don't have to explain them this time. Um, what we did see on the validity scales, we don't see um, evidence of um, inconsistency. We do see this RBS elevation again. 
So this is the scale, again, that we might want to look at other performance validity or symptom validity tests. We did not see that the performance validity tests were elevated. Again, unfortunately, in telehealth, we aren't allowed to give the ones that are most valid. Um, so that's a limitation. But we did see symptom overreporting on other measures that have symptom overreporting scales. Um, so the possible overreporting of responses related to non credible cognitive complaints was definitely an issue. In the somatic cognitive um, scales for this individual, we are seeing more elevations. So one was elevated, as was um, Nuke and Cog. Again, we can look later at cynicism and shyness. It's not really a major player here for this profile, but we would go look at that because of that elevation. So the manual would tell us that this individual, these elevations are consistent with somebody who reports multiple somatic complaints, particularly vague neurological complaints and a diffuse pattern of cognitive complaints. Um, from an empirical uh, correlate standpoint, this person may be preoccupied with physical health concerns or be prone to developing physical symptoms in response to stress um, or is not able to cope with stress and may also have a low tolerance for frustration. Um, again, we wanted, would want to interpret this in the context, particularly with Nuke and Cog, that RBS was high. So we would want to consider that. This was an individual who did report a lot of cognitive concerns, um, losing train of thought while talking, repeating themselves when they said it. This individual had more complaints that were along the lines of memory problems, like forgetting to do assignments, forgetting plans they made with others. Um, also, a, a more unusual concern that we don't usually hear, distinguishing fake memories from real memories, um, being, and then more traditional things that we hear when people are concerned about ADHD, being easily distracted from their work. Um, their report, though, was all these problems started in college. Um, they also reported having a brief period of time when they, when an antidepressant medication that they had taken earlier in college, that, that one of the side effects were very significant memory problems and that once they discontinued that, the memory improved but had never gone back to normal. So we did see somebody who had a lot more um, unusual cognitive report relative to people who often report with the concern of ADHD. Um, this person did not report any neurological complaints in the interview, and so that NUC score being high was a little unusual. However, later when we see panic symptoms, there were a bit more panic symptoms <coughs> that are neurological in nature than we often see in typical panic um, complaints, and also some unusual sleep symptoms. Maybe that's partly the source. We do have to remember that elevated uh, validity scale, um, RBS as well. Um, in this case, the individual did have a medical condition that led to joint pain over their whole body that they did find occasionally distracting, but managed well with exercise and no other medical history. So we want to keep that in mind with regard to the RC1 elevation. And again, I should note that for, in terms of cognitive test performance, all scores were averaged to above average on actual objective performance, which was true of the other client too. I forgot to mention that. Emotional dysfunction on the demoralizing side, we see a lot less elevations than the prior client. Um, we see NFC and then again, the introversion scale are elevated and, and, and none of the footnoted ones were elevated. So that's not on here. So this, this pattern of elevations would be consistent with somebody who reports being passive, indecisive, inefficacious, um, empirical correlates may experience subjective incompetence, may lack perseverance and self-reliance also reporting a lack of positive emotional experiences and avoiding social situations. This is the IMTR elevation, may experience problems with anhedonia or lacking interests. Again, we want to keep in mind that RC2 isn't elevated, although it is T equals 60. They did not report um, suicidal ideation. And the client's history is they did have a history of a depressive episode that lasted a pretty lengthy period of time at the beginning of college uh, while in a toxic relationship. Um, at that time, did meet criteria for major depressive episode and had been placed on several different antidepressant medications, one of which had the terrible cognitive side effects. Um, did report, we'll talk later, about not liking large crowds, but does is able to make friends generally. Um, currently didn't report symptoms consistent with depression, or did report symptoms consistent with depression, although not as diagnosable as depression, and was, was on Prozac. 
and indeed consistent with the lack of SUI elevation, didn't report any history of suicidal ideation or current suicidal ideation. But we do see in the RC7 facets a lot of elevation. And as you can see, that was really the domain for this particular client. So we've got a lot of negative emotion experiences, again, in the interest of time. Obviously, stress worry is up, worry is up, um, compulsions are up, anxiety-related symptoms are up, brief um, restrictive fears are up, Meggy is up, overall seven is up. So we have a lot of the domains, again, including compulsive behavior um, and uh, pretty high scores on, on ARX and in blue, you can see this is consistent with this person. Uh, she talked about her brain being preoccupied with repetitive fear field thoughts. I'm sorry, they, I, I, I misgendered this individual, sorry. Um, they reported a lot of anxiety and fear response that included physical pressure, numbness, um, high startle, being diagnosed with panic attacks in the past and they're not having them current. More interesting is this person did describe some compulsions and some tick-like kinds of behaviors that they repeat on a regular basis starting in adolescence uh, that they aren't necessarily aware of. They definitely find them soothing. They definitely increase under stress, but they're not so compulsive that they have to do it. This person also reported intrusive ideation. Um, so having these intrusive thoughts that are of an anxiety nature, like you're going to be in an accident if you don't turn right now, or this food might be poisoned. Um, uh, some kind of premonition, some kind of visual scary intrusive imagery sometimes that put them on edge. And uh, one of the empirical correlates for all of these that I went through rather fast is problems with sleep. And this person reported a great deal of sleep um, and daytime sleepiness to the point of napping excessively for hours every day. In the behavioral dysfunction scales, what was very interesting is highly consistent low scores um, higher than average level of behavioral constraint and below average impulsive behavior. So we have this compulsions scale high, but not impulsivity. So BXD is actually lowish. Again, it's a 39, but it is consistent with the 37 on impulsivity and the 34 on disconstraint. However, this client did not describe themselves as unusually constrained. They didn't report any problems with impulsivity. Um, but this is interesting that, that there's a very level, big level of constraint for this client. In interpersonal dysfunction, we also see some interesting low scores. Um, and again, these low scores are in the context of there's no evidence of underreporting. So um, this uh, individual describes themselves as passive and submissive, submissive um, describes themselves as not liking to be in charge, not, not being assertive. Uh, empirical correlates, again, being passive and submissive in interpersonal relationships. Um, social avoidance was barely elevated, not enjoying social events and avoiding social situations, maybe being introverted. Um, and this is not consistent with how the client described themselves. They didn't describe themselves as unusually passive, submissive, or assertive, although that wasn't the focus of the presenting problem. Um, and there are two scales that are in that direction, the DOM and the aggression. So social avoidance was up, shy was not. Um, and again, the footnote says you should also look at self-doubt and ineffectiveness. And they were not, uh, ineffectiveness was elevated, but not self-doubt. So the manual says when you put all those together, it's not likely a avoidant personality. And it's not likely um, social phobia because we're not seeing those other components that would go with that. So, um, and they reported a small circle of friends as opposed to a large friend network work, but they do have friends. Um, so in this case, the, the socially avoidant one is not likely avoidant personality or social phobia. And we don't really have a good sense from our assessment that's passive and submissive kind of components. Maybe it would be important to consider in treatment. And again, we don't have elevations on thought dysfunction. So in this particular case, what we do have is a much different profile than on the first one. And um, in the interest of time, I'm just going to flip back through it. So cognitive, we did not have actual cognitive impairment. We did not have evidence of impairment in everyday life. Um, but, and we did have this RBS elevation. 
Um, we do have uh, some slightly unusual neurologic concerns, but again, that validity scale, we got to consider consider that potentially contributing because those do load on RBS a little bit. Um, we do have this ineffectiveness and potentially maybe socially introversion kind of component, but we definitely are getting a lot in the emotional dysfunction uh, area that ultimately is where we spent more time focusing in terms of considering diagnoses. So spending a lot more time on the compulsions and the intrusive ideation uh, because they came through here in the interview and on the MMPI. And while this is something we are still working on as a case, um, we are looking at sort of, um, uh, oh, I didn't even mention that another compulsion is um, uh, uh, skin picking to the point of, of causing wounds. Um, and so that's something that we're considering within the concept of that, that compulsivity. Um, how much is this potentially uh, panic related versus OCD tick related um, versus maybe generalized anxiety? All of those things we're working on because of this MMPI profile, but it's still a, 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 a thought.